NASA's satellite detects something mysterious in the Amazon. When we think of NASA's discoveries and work, more often than not we think of planets, space exploration, and technology. We frequently fail to consider the work this technology can do for us here on Earth. Back in 1976, the NASA Landsat satellite captured a photograph that would spark decades of discussion, debate, and speculation. The Landsat satellite photograph filed under the memorable name CS11-32071-03 showed an image of southeast Peru in the Madre de Dios region of the Amazon rainforest. This would be simply another routine photograph taken in orbit archived as usual except that the photo shows a series of mysterious dots which began to raise questions. From the satellite image, the dots appear to be spaced out intentionally, symmetrically, and are linear and uniform creating a cookie-cutter impression with their regularity. Two rows of four dots were visible. Many guessed these were a formation of pyramids with at least eight near-identical structures all standing together. Many names were thrown towards these dots, including Pyramids of Paratuari, the Dots of Peru, and the Pyramids of Pantiacola. Despite the excited claim of pyramids being found, this was all speculation with no confirmation and minimal details being visible in the satellite picture. Researchers and enthusiasts grew further intrigued by the possible pyramids, with many believing that they are close enough to the lost city of Paititi for there to be links to the city and its possible civilization often believed to be Inca. Paititi is a supposed lost city, a society of legends. It is described as an ancient but is covered with the Peruvian and Brazilian rainforest. While searches for the city have not been successful, it has given researchers the chance to try to hunt down the pyramids of Parachuari too. Some, such as the president of the South American Explorers Club, Don Montague, believe the conjecture is nothing more than rumors, ideas, and fantasies, labeling what some people had dubbed pyramids as simply odd geological formations. Many theorists continue to speculate, however, believing that the pyramids of Paratuari are indeed man-made and were built by an ancient civilization. The structure that may have provided more information could have been engulfed by the rainforest since its construction. Between the growth of vegetation and the long time period, this claim is not entirely implausible. A number of expeditions, adventures, and missions had been set out aiming to uncover these pyramids, spanning 1984 to 2011 with little success. Gregory de Amengen led a large proportion of these expeditions, and whilst he did not find pyramids, these missions were not failures by any means. He found evidence of Inca people living in the area, including petroglyphs, paved roads, platforms, and plazas. However, there was nothing found to suggest the dots in Landsat's image were man-made, nor that they were pyramids. Da Amengen suggested that these so-called pyramids were actually made of sandstone, and were natural, not man-made formations. The geographical term for this would be truncated rich spur, a natural formation that is essentially nature's pyramid. Similar discoveries were made by D. A. Mengen in Rio Timpia. There are still whispers of the formation being pyramids today, with the documentary The Secret of the Incas covering a 2011 expedition to the pyramids of Parachuari. However, the most common modern consensus is simply that this is a natural formation, not one built by Inca populations. The Sunken City of Cuba a little over a decade ago, a team of explorers were working on an exploration and survey mission off the western coast of Cuba when all of a the sudden, their sonar navigation equipment started picking up something absolutely bizarre. The technology was picking up a series of distinct stone structures lying 650 meters below the surface. The structures at first seemed remarkably similar to the desolate ocean floor. But upon further investigation, the structures were symmetrically organized stones similar to what you would find in an urban development. Of course, following this discovery, a media flurry soon began with headlines about the lost city of Atlantis being discovered in Cuba. With news coverage, these researchers also attracted the interest of the government, the National Geographic and the National Museum who promised to investigate the sonar images. Over a decade later, there is little research and no investigation to show for this unusual discovery. Pauline Zalitsky, a marine engineer, and her husband own the company based out of Canada called Advanced Digital Communications. They were working on a survey mission in conjunction with the Cuban government off the coast of Cuba. Advanced Digital Communications were one of four firms working in a venture with Fidel Castro's government to explore Cuban waters. Their primary interest was finding treasure-laden shipwrecks from the Spanish colonial era. The team was using heavily advanced equipment to scan the area when they noticed these bizarre structures. 
Some of these structures were formed with smooth blocks and geometric shapes. Other blocks looked like they were being built into pyramid shapes, others were completely circular. Months later, they returned to the site with another geologist, Manuel Iterald Venino, head investigator from Cuba's Natural History Museum. Knowing what they would find in this area, they returned with the appropriate technology to examine and record the structures. The large blocks seemed to resemble granite and measured about 8 feet by 10 feet. The investigator from the museum said that if he had to explain this geologically, he would have a hard time coming up with an answer. The main piece of this that is so confusing is that it would have taken around 50,000 years for such structures to have sunk into the depth at which they were found. The catch is that 50,000 years ago there was not the archaeological capacity in any of the cultures we were aware of at the time to build such complex things. Despite such a media flurry, this story was soon buried and the site left unresearched. The quick dismissal of the story has led some to question whether or not there has been suppression of information regarding the finding. Whether the leads just went cold or this is something that we were not supposed to find, we might not ever know. Archaeologists uncover secret passage to the underworld at Pyramid of the Moon in Teotihuacan. The Pyramid of the Moon found within Mexico is the second largest pyramid you can find within San Juan Teotihuacan, with only the Pyramid of the Sun beating its grandeur. You can track down this monument at the end of the Avenue of the Dead. The Avenue of the Dead has been used as a site for Mayan rituals in which both animal and human sacrifices were performed. Made. However, building on research carried out up to 300 years ago, recently archaeologists unearthed a concealed tunnel within the pyramid, leading into a 15-meter chamber embedded well into the Pyramid of the Moon. Some archaeologists have suggested that this tunnel was believed to have acted as a passage into the underworld. The existence of this tunnel was revealed by archaeologists affiliated with Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History, or INAGE. So the research project was rather collaborative with geophysicist teams from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. During the 1980s, a series of excavations began to be conducted, revealing skeletons appearing to have cranial deformation and injuries tucked away within the beloved Pyramid of the Moon. Another strange discovery made throughout multiple excavations is a mix of greenstone objects. Many also claim that the discovery of riches made within the tunnels suggests there could be more beneath the surface, underground with the Plays de la Luna, presenting the possibility of a different entranceway into a possible network of tunnels. This finding presents a large opportunity to develop our cultural and historical knowledge due to the Mecca of civilization emerging from the city of Teotihuacan, a place of great sacred value, which subsequently received offerings of higher significance. Therefore, discovering a new aspect to a site of cultural importance gives insight to researchers into the varying relationships and roles within communities and regions of Mesoamerica. Many hypotheses and predictions have been confirmed, solidifying some cultural assumptions made through the discovery of this temple within the Pyramid of the Moon. Perhaps the most notable example of this is the belief that those who lived within Teotihuacan aimed to replicate the underworld through the designing of their temples, explaining the concealed and underground nature of the tunnel and temple that were discovered. Using electrical scanning technology, an image of the subsurface was able to be formed, allowing archaeologists to identify the remains of various animals, including wolves and pumas, as well as an ability to identify different areas of the subsurface. Both culturally and scientifically, a breakthrough of this scale is of huge significance, providing a glimpse into a society we know little definitive information about. From the peculiar garden findings to space exploration to an understanding of ancient societies, there is a broad range of research being conducted in our modern day. Not an island, but a sinkhole. Welcome to Oak Island. You have just arrived on a piece of privately owned land that is densely covered with trees along the south shore of Nova Scotia. As you start exploring, you might note how explorers such as yourself have been passionately investigating, hunting, and excavating for treasure since the late 1700s. However, that might not be the precedent going into the future. Why so? That is because, according to a retired geologist Stephen Aitken, Oak Island's money pit is doomed to sink in the future. After spending decades of his life in the oil business, he applied his knowledge to the land and came up with the startling conclusion. Instead of finding the treasure that people have been searching for over 200 years, he realized that he was standing on a sinkhole. 
Upon venturing out to the notorious pit, he first took note of the bedrock that it was it was made of limestone and gypsum, which under the right conditions of temperature, pressure, and poor fluid composition would be at great risk of disintegration. Could that mean that the money pit contains underwater caves which would collapse? According to Aitken, that is exactly correct. Once the rocks collapse, you are left with a bedrock cavity. In fact, the geological evidence that the scientists studied has already suggested that the cave's roof had already fallen apart. Throughout all the tunnels and pits that have formed, that also proves the existence of many other sinkholes nearby that have formed naturally over thousands to millions of years. With such stunning geological evidence, perhaps the real treasure is not the gold or the jewels that mystery hunters fantasize about, but the archaeological artifacts worth discovering. They could potentially open the doors to fascinating knowledge and about the rich history that has taken place on the island, whether it involves farming, logging, shipbuilding, or more. Just to be sure to grab hold of this treasure before it collapses into a sinkhole. Is there really treasure on Oak Island? By now you are probably intrigued by the one question that every mystery fanatic is anxious to learn. Is there really any treasure on Oak Island? Many people were so fascinated by this question that they took it upon themselves to dedicate entire years to answer it. Most famously, brothers Rick and Marty Legaina from Michigan were so passionate that they actually bought the rights to the island in an attempt to solve the mystery. They relied on modern technology and their American know-how to locate the treasure. Because several people had passed away before trying to achieve great wealth on the island, there was a curse that had loomed over their expedition as well as the trips of numerous explorers across the years. They were all motivated either by the idea of getting rich or by the pure curiosity of finding out the truth themselves. That emerged of what exactly could be so valuable under the island grounds. One of them was the idea that there was buried treasure that belonged to a 17th century pirate named Captain Kidd. A local legend proclaimed from the words of a dying sailor that the pirate crew had buried over two million pounds worth of treasure underground. Was it ever found? Not exactly, but clues point to the evidence that it is more than just a legend alone. In the 19th century, hunters found a stone in the money pit that had symbolic inscriptions which read, 40 feet below, two million pounds lie buried. Another story that came about was the possibility of there being Spanish naval treasure after a Spanish galleon docked at the island throughout a bout of bad weather. They buried their treasure with the intention of coming back, but never did. Could that be where the Spanish coin came from? There are far more rumored treasures than those two stories cover alone. If you ever get a chance to visit the island, you can put a whole list of items to find on your agenda, such as Shakespeare's manuscripts, the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, a Viking ship, Mary Antoinette's jewels, British imperial treasures, and far more. Though none of these stories have ever been definitively proven, plenty of treasure hunters have found thousands of unique treasures in their own rights. They include jeweled brooches, bone fragments, some ancient manuscripts, a Roman sword, coins, crossbow bolts, a ship race, ancient pottery, and plenty more. So really, is there treasure on Oak Island? That depends on what you define treasure as. But we will have to go with a resounding yes. For all mystery lovers, the intrigue that surrounds the Oak Island Money Pit is a treasure in its own right. The Great Pyramid of Cholula Located in Cholula, Puebla, Mexico, the Great Pyramid of Cholula is one of the largest pyramids by volume in the entire world. Its base is four times larger than the Great Pyramid at Giza in Egypt, standing 450 meters wide and 66 meters tall. In the Nahuatl language, it translates to man-made mountain. Not much is known about it, so many generations had passed since its construction that the pyramid was hidden by vegetation and believed to be only a hill by the Cortez and his men. They settled in the city of Cholula and built their own church on top of it, failing to realize that it was a sacred pyramid. It wasn't until the 20th century that locals discovered the pyramid. As it turned out, it wasn't just one pyramid but six, all nested on top of each other. It had probably been a thousand every stage of civilization in that area had continued to occasionally build upon the site and improved the previous generation's work. Researchers hypothesized that its construction began around 300 BC as a way to appeal to the god Quetzalcoatl or the feathered serpent. There are reliefs and drawings throughout the structure of serpents. Ultimately, they believe that construction was finally abandoned between the 7th and 8th century CE. As population size rapidly decreased and newer temples were built within the city. Over time, the jungle grew to surround it, therefore hiding it from the Spaniards' view. The pyramid, surprisingly, is built out of adobe bricks. 
Mud was mixed with sand or ceramic and left to bake in the sun until it became a hardened block. They then smothered the outer bricks down with more earth until it was a paintable surface on which they drew colorful insects, skulls, and other symbols. Despite the humidity in Mexico, the base foundation has remained strong, allowing excavations without needing support beams set up. Skeletons have been found inside the pyramid and in the immediate surrounding areas, suggesting it was used as a burial site for some ethnic groups. Clay figurines, musical instruments, and tools were also found. Interest in this pyramid has always waxed and waned in favor of other structures. Despite its rich pre-Hispanic history, excavation teams occasionally received funds to explore, but primarily for the purpose of making it into a sort of attraction. It is for this reason that the pyramid is still mostly unknown and unstudied today. Its condition makes it difficult to reconstruct the site to what it once was, making it a low priority for governments. The church sitting on top of the pyramid has such a historic and religious significance to the local population. It is a Catholic pilgrimage site and used for indigenous celebrations. Due to its importance as a colonial monument, the pyramid underneath has not been properly excavated. Only five miles or so have been uncovered by archaeologists. It receives almost a quarter of a million visitors every year and is considered the main attraction in Cholula as you can wander through the tunnels and visit the museum to see all of the artifacts they have found so far. The Lost Labyrinth of Egypt The impressive pyramids and massive structures that line the banks of the Nile River have long baffled historians and tourists alike, and we can only guess at how the ancient civilization managed to complete such enormous marbles of engineering. But this puzzlement does not stop at our own time period. Records of visitors professing their astonishment at Egyptian construction date back even thousands of years. In fact, some of these records indicate that at one point there might have been a structure even more impressive than the pyramids to behold. Many ancient visitors to Egypt described an incredibly sprawling temple complex that they referred to as the labyrinth due to its twisting corridors and hallways so intricate that one would only be able to successfully navigate the interior in the company of a knowledgeable guide. This labyrinth was documented in writings beginning in the 3rd century BC and continuing through the 1st century AD by ancient authors as well as ancient Greek historian Herodotus who wrote of his experience visiting Egypt. This I have actually seen, a work beyond words. For if anyone put together the buildings of the Greeks and display of their labors, they would seem lesser in both effort and expense to this labyrinth. Even the pyramids are beyond words and each was equal to many and mighty works of the Greeks. Yet the labyrinth surpasses even the pyramids. The varying accounts, although occurring centuries apart, are all relatively consistent enough to allow us to paint a general picture of what the structure might have looked like. However, none of these accounts indicate whether the passages were maze-like as a deterrent to intruders or as a show of the wealth and power of the Egyptians. The labyrinth was said to contain over 3,000 rooms with hieroglyphs and paintings of impressive beauty. Generally, descriptions indicate that the structure consisted of 12 complex courts surrounding an elaborate maze at the center with a roof made out of a single stone slab. Her feet almost impossible to imagine even with modern technology and equipment. One aspect that is not agreed upon in the many accounts of this fantastical place is the reason for constructing such an immense project. Among the alleged purposes are a tomb, a temple, a gathering place for religious ceremonies, or simply a testament to Egypt's power and greatness. Although the many independent accounts leave no doubt as to whether such a structure existed, archaeologists have yet to find such a location despite identifying several potential sites for further excavation. The disappearance of Susan Pearson in 1966, a woman by the name of Susan Elizabeth Pearson was last seen in Missoula, Montana and has not been seen since. Ms. Pearson, an American woman from Portland, Oregon, went missing due to mysterious circumstances. She had been a graduate student at the University of Montana and was teaching there as an instructor at the time of her disappearance, days before her doctoral thesis was due. She was last seen by her friends on campus as she was meant to take her business administration exam but never arrived. Likewise, Susan missed two work checks meant for her adding up to $1,200, which were never claimed. Initial searches for the woman were futile, yet when the police checked her apartment, they found it in pristine condition, untouched with not a single sign of struggle. Her car was soon thereafter found completely abandoned. In Missoula's business district, her belongings were still in the car when the police checked it. They found her keys, purse, and other necessities inside, ones that any sane person would never leave unattended. 
Bones were found in 1970 but were analyzed and found to be animal remains. Susan Elizabeth Pearson is one of the oldest missing persons cases Montana has had in the past century. Ms. Pearson was the granddaughter of Walter Pearson, Oregon's Democratic senator. Susan King, who was one of Susan Pearson's friends and a prominent singer at a nightclub, told the police that she had visited her on the night before her sudden disappearance and that Pearson was in a frantic, nervous state. It was just a different Sue, she had stated. A prominent piece of the puzzle was the information King also received. Pearson mentioned leaving her life behind. Begin anew in her frantic state. Later, she added that two delinquent boys from the course she was teaching threatened her with physical violence. Pearson's brother, David, added that it appeared his sister rushed out of her apartment and the tea kettle was left to boil on the stove. Days after her disappearance, there was a report of a sighting in Lolo Pass, but evidence of her actually being there is non-existent. No further sightings were ever reported. The 1,500-year-old Bible argues Jesus' fate. Christianity is broken into many sectors throughout the years, each adhering to their own moral codes and interpreting the Bible in different ways. Like any piece of literature, the Bible is indeed up to interpretation. However, it's hard to interpret a story when it was never told in the first place. According to the Ethnography Museum of Ankara, Turkey, a new version of the Bible believed to be 15 to 2,000 years old has resurfaced and caused upheaval to the Christian faith. This is because this Bible includes the Gospel of Barnabas. The story reveals that Jesus was never nailed to the cross, but he was also not the Son of God. This story insists that Jesus was only a prophet and that his fate was not crucifixion at all, but that he instead made it to heaven. However, the story of crucifixion is not completely lost. Judas Iscariot was believed to be nailed to the cross instead. This book came to light during a heist when a group of thieves attempted to smuggle highly valuable goods across the Mediterranean Sea. This version of the Bible is believed to be worth over $25 million, both for its shocking revelations and antiquity. It's no secret that the world of Christianity and the world of Islam have been at odds for years. However, this contention is largely based on how we as people should interpret Jesus and thus honor him thereafter. Because this new biblical story reveals that Jesus quite possibly knew the prophet Muhammad and foresaw his arrival, it can be said that if Christians do decide to honor this new gospel then their teachings and belief systems might align differently. However, it is common practice of any church, but especially the Christian church, to pick and choose which stories they want to include in modern practice. That the word homosexual was included in the Bible. It takes a keen scholarly eye to authenticate the true intent of Jesus' word at the conception of the Bible, but it takes only several elders of the church to manipulate the transcriptions to align with modern belief systems. While the Vatican remains highly interested in this new finding, it cannot be said whether the entirety of Christianity will change because of it. We do know one thing, though. More than 1,500 years, then it is reasonable to wonder what else is out there. Sir Victor Goddard and the Time Slip The skies are a wondrous place and ever since man evolved, we've dreamt of being able to fly. Of course, this is now possible and thanks to the technological advancements in aircraft, being able to fly has meant that human eyes have seen things that we should not necessarily have seen. If you've ever been to Scotland, you'll know that its impressive landscapes and sprawling greenery can be extremely relaxing and very picturesque to fly over. But for one man in 1935, his routine flight over the highlands became a little strange. When Commander Victor Goddard was conducting a routine aerial inspection of a disused World War I Air Force base at Drem near East Lothian, the base, which was dilapidated and had not been used for years, appeared to be being used as a farm. A day or two later, Goddard flew back towards his own base. It was a gray and rainy Monday with low visibility and high winds completely the wrong conditions for a pleasant flight, as you can imagine. He attempted to navigate towards Drem, but couldn't work out where to fly, given the conditions. Suddenly, Goddard lost complete control of his plane. It plummeted towards Earth through the thick gray cloud, which offered no brakes. As he reached 200 feet, he was certain it was over. But it wasn't. Goddard reported seeing swirling water and a stony beach and was flying near 150 miles an hour. Drem's hangars appeared as a silhouette in the bleakness of the afternoon and as he approached the airfield the skies brightened completely. As he flew nearer he noticed a distinct difference in Drem's appearance. The airfield was freshly tarmacked, the hangars restored and four bright yellow aircraft sat on the stand. One model of aircraft he didn't recognize, a monoplane of a new variation with RAF markings. 
The RAF had no monoplanes, not even for training purposes. There were men working on the ground wearing light blue overalls, which was also strange as the mechanics that Goddard was used to seeing normally wore tan gray. Nobody seemed to notice Goddard's plane flying low over the airfield and as he pulled his joystick backwards and powered back into the skies, the gray skies and Ray returned. Soon he was near his intended destination and landed. Dazed, Goddard tried to comprehend what he'd seen, but simply couldn't. His colleagues thought he was either drunk or mad and he stopped telling his story. However, for years later, the airbase at Drem would be refurbished. The RAF uniforms would change to light blue and a new training monoplane painted bright yellow arrived on the tarmac at Drem. As time went by, Victor Goddard came to the startling conclusion that he'd, in fact, when the ancient Greek civilization first journeyed to Egypt and laid witness to the ancient cultures, methods of construction, megalithic structures, sprawling cities, and seemingly advanced technologies, along with the civilization's incredible strides in mathematics and philosophy, not only were they completely intrigued by this, but they quickly worked to try to classify what they saw and provided it with the names we know today. When the ancient Greeks came across the large stone structure that depicted what they presumed to be a lion with the face of a man, reminding the Greeks of the stories of the Sphinx recorded in the struggle of Oedipus, they quickly named the structure of the Sphinx as an ode to their own culture seen in the Egyptian culture. However, outside of this original encounter, nothing else was known surrounding the strange structure. This, in turn, has caused various discoveries to be made about the structure and various theories to be put forward in order to explain the origins of the structure. Is there evidence of water erosion? During the early 1950s, French Egyptologist R. A. Schwalder de Lubitz visited the Great Sphinx enclosure and remarked that there was a substantial amount of water erosion across the structure. Believing that perhaps the structure had been submerged at one point in time and had not been significantly weathered by the wind as previous theories had claimed. Shortly after this claim, Schwal was labeled a mystic and slandered by countless other archaeologists who believed that Schwal was making up the claim to appeal to a fringe group of theorists at the time. Despite these personal attacks, alternative Egyptologist and author John Anthony West sought out the opinion of the Associate Professor of Natural Sciences at the College of General Studies at Boston University, a geologist by the name of Robert M. Schott. Back in 1989, Robert M. Schott then spent a significant amount of time investigating the enclosure's geology and came to the conclusion that the main type of weathering that was evident on the Sphinx's enclosure walls were caused by significant amounts of water damage and not that of natural wind and sand degradation previously theorized. Interestingly, Robert Schock also found that the weathering was consistent with blocks found at the Valley Temples, leading Schock to claim the following statement. Therefore, if the granite facing is covering deeply weathered limestone, the original limestone structures must predate by considerable degree the granite facing. Obviously, if the limestone cores originating from the Sphinx ditch of the temples predate the granite ashlers, granite facings, and the granite ashlers are attributable to the Khafre of the 4th dynasty, then the Great Sphinx was built prior to the reign of Khafre. Given the fact that the Egyptian government is keen to maintain the history that the ancient Egyptian civilization was responsible for the megalithic structures and not some unknown civilization that predates their culture, it would explain why efforts had been made to cover up the findings over the decades. Today, the water erosion hypothesis is still shunned by the Egyptological community. There's also been a lot of conversation about the secret tunnels under the Great Sphinx. Back in 1987, a Japanese research team from Tokyo's Wazita University began an extensive underground survey of the regions surrounding the Great Sphinx statue. Utilizing groundbreaking technology at the time known as the Electromagnetic Sounding Survey Radar in an attempt to better image the sunken regions of the Sphinx statue. Under the direction of lead researcher Sakuhi Yoshimura, the team got some of the most accurate 3D rendered images of the statue ever seen with the strange revelation that no one had seen coming. For some unknown reason, the Japanese survey team discovered an extensive system of cavities and tunnels inside and underneath the Great Sphinx monolith that were believed to have been previously undiscovered. According to the team, south of the Sphinx was a hollow tunnel believed to have been 2.5 meters wide and 3 meters tall connecting two chambers, a small and large chamber that appears to connect to additional tunnels that stretch north, south and southeast of the Sphinx's direction. 
Portions of shafts were found in unconnected areas beneath the Sphinx with additional cavities found inside the structure of the Sphinx and beside the body of the Sphinx unconnected to the tunnels beneath the monolith. None of these findings have been pursued after the survey, with many denying the existence of the tunnels and shafts despite the mountains of clear imaging evidence gathered under the direction of lead researchers. Another question that's been put forward is, is the Sphinx really a Sphinx? Originally a theory put forward by the groundbreaking author Robert Temple, there appeared to be overwhelming evidence that the Sphinx we know today was actually an attempt made by a pharaoh of the fourth dynasty to do nothing more than to claim the works of those before him. Evidence for this can be found when analyzing the head-to-body ratio of the large Sphinx statue. The head on the Sphinx is so small compared to the rest of its body that researchers had often believed, upon first sight, that it could have been grinded down from a much more massive structure. The second piece of evidence provided by the hieroglyphics located at the Temple of Temchifer that outline in great detail that the original god of ancient Giza was Anubis, and the accounts and images of Anubis in his jackal form are drawn all throughout the site in the same pose as of the body of the Sphinx, with no mention of a lion of any kind at that ancient city. Interestingly, this exact same pose was discovered in one of the only tombs of an Egyptian pharaoh ever discovered that had been completely undisturbed since his burial the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Within King Tut's tomb is a shrine to Anubis that demonstrates an exact scale of the Sphinx statue, but with the head of a jackal to represent Anubis, showing an overwhelming evidence that the original statue of the ancient city of Giza was supposed to be that of a jackal-headed Anubis and not that of a lion body with a human head. So, where do we get the idea of a human head and a lion body? The truth is, the only reason why the statue is referred to as a sphinx is because of old Greek mythologies such as those of Oedipus that talk about a lion with the head of a man called a sphinx but no such symbol exists in that of ancient Egypt. This means that the hieroglyphic texts that describe the sphinx with a human head to represent the pharaoh of the fourth dynasty were nothing more than forgeries. And these were by the then pharaoh to take credit for a great statue of which he had not created nor designed. In fact, a pre-dynastic pharaoh gives a great account about providing his royal dog as a grand burial at the site of ancient Giza. In this text, his argument for why he had such a royal burial for what has been speculated to be his guard dog was due to his want and need to have the dog buried before the great god Anubis. Not only definitively proving that the sphinx was originally that of the god Anubis in the jackal form, but also that the structure itself was created during the pre-dynastic times long before any pharaoh could claim ownership of its creation. So does the sphinx predate Egypt? Given the fact that the pharaoh of the fourth dynasty forged the creation of the sphinx under his name, countless researchers believe that the sphinx could in fact be far older than anyone else has ever realized. In fact, new evidence and research today has found that it could very well be possible that the Sphinx structure itself is far older than supposed Egyptian writings and documents. One of the main reasons for why the Sphinx has been dated its current age of 4,511 years old is not due to carbon dating or other reliable efforts made to accurately measure its date but rather because of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and documents, which that detail that the Sphinx was supposedly created during the reign of Egypt's fourth dynasty. Unfortunately, it was recently discovered that these documents could very well not be legitimate and that the pharaoh of the fourth dynasty forged them for the sole purpose of taking credit of another past pharaoh's work. A common practice amongst pharaohs to rewrite history and take the honor of a past pharaoh's lifelong efforts. This could very well mean that not only was the creation of the Sphinx older than that of the dynastic reigns of Egypt, but that perhaps the structure is older than the Egyptian civilization themselves. Further evidence of this theory can be found when analyzing the recent archaeological finds of strange bones discovered all throughout ancient Egypt. It is well known amongst Egyptologists that the ancient Egyptians treasured animals of all kinds, believing them to be the representation of their gods. It is due to this observation that strange structures and bones from animals all around the world, even from areas previously believed to have not been operating open trade routes, have surfaced all across ancient Egyptian cities. Described as Egyptian zoos, strange hieroglyphics and designs have come forward showing evidence that not only were the early Egyptians capable of owning strange beasts from around the world, but that they possibly possessed an extinct species of woolly mammoth. Dubbed as the world's first zoo, a 6,000-year-old ancient Egyptian cemetery was uncovered filled with the remains of wild animals from all around the world that should have been unable to collect from the reaches of early man for thousands of years to come. 
Skeletons of ostriches, crocodiles, leopards, and other exotic animals were found alongside pools of water, large fenced-in cages, and a potential animal hospital filled with removed molars, teeth, claws, and evidence of animal surgeries. Though the importance of animals regarding the Egyptian religion was widely known, the evidence of the global reach of the species available to them, including species long believed to be extinct, has been a mystery that even the most elite of archaeologists and Egyptologists have failed to explain. This is odd though mostly due to the fact that it is widely believed by historians and archaeologists all around the world that the oldest civilization to exist was merely 10,000 years old. However, evidence in the fossil record shows that the modern-day intelligent human has been around for more than 500,000 years. If this is true, why is it then that the oldest cities don't start appearing until past 10,000 years? It might have to do with the evidence of the extinct animals recorded at Egypt. The woolly mammoth was one of many distinct megafauna that went extinct at around the same time in the fossil record, nearly 10,000 years ago. These extinct species included the mastodon, short-faced bear, the giant ground sloth, and many others. In fact, when Charles Darwin first visited the areas near the Galapagos Islands, when he originally discovered the ground sloth bones, they were so fresh that he believed them to still be a living species of megafauna, ultimately proving the recency of their extinction. So why was it then that around 10,000 years ago of all these species went extinct, partly due to three strange reasons, large fires, a massive flood, and a sudden ice age? The evidence for these three events are widely known by archaeologists and research scientists that found in the fossil record evidence that showed that all around the Earth. There appeared to be massive fires that were followed by a rapid cooling event that only took about four decades as well as certain events being hit by numerous tsunamis and large flooding. Many experts had originally speculated that perhaps a massive meteorite strike could have caused such a phenomenon, but no large craters supporting the theory had yet been discovered at the time of the original publications. However, recently a massive crater underneath an ice sheet in Greenland shows a tremendous impact point where a meteor could have hit, generating more than 700 megatons of force, so much force in fact that it would have caused a full-on nuclear winter. Any human civilization at the time, regardless of how advanced, would have been completely wiped off the face of the Earth in such a massive meteor strike. All of this happening at not only around the same time as a massive extinction event, but also around the same time the oldest civilizations would have been constructed. Could this be evidence then that perhaps the pyramids at Giza and the Sphinx, as well as many other advancements made in megalithic structures and creations, could actually more accurately have come from the efforts of human beings from before this catastrophic event and the Egyptians were merely one of many surviving people to pick up where humanity left off. Given the incredible advancements we have made in the past 10,000 years, this could very well mean that the humans before the event could have been significantly more advanced than we are today. And the old stories of gods and kings could very well have just been the technological advancements before humanity had to reset due to such a catastrophic tragedy. All across the world there are reports of impossible to explain flying disc-shaped aircraft that demonstrate capabilities that violate all known laws of physics and appear to be technologically far too advanced to be explained in the modern day. In fact, there are more than 8,000 annual cases of sightings of such craft every single year, with thousands more going unreported for fear of ridicule. These sightings, however, are not the most extraordinary stories surrounding these impossible to explain craft but rather the peculiar forms of life that seem to inhabit them. Often described as humanoid, the pilots of these craft vary from all shapes, sizes, species, and behaviors. From small, three-foot-tall little gray men to ten-foot-tall Sasquatch-like creatures to lanky, seven-foot-tall insect-like creatures that look eerily similar to the praying mantis. Although UFO and alien enthusiasts have often been quick to proclaim that such sightings and encounters are evidence of extraterrestrial life visiting from faraway planets and solar systems, there appears to be a profound amount of evidence that has been growing over the past several decades. Gathered by independent research efforts on a ranch out in the middle of nowhere that has started to chip away at these claims and posited a far more terrifying theory. Perhaps these sightings, these craft, and these extraterrestrial sightings are not extraterrestrial at all, but a matter of the interdimensional. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we will be going over the mystery and evidence gathered at the Skinwalker Ranch and the possible interdimensional technology behind it that has led to mass visitation of our little blue planet. Thank you for watching. Interbasin is no stranger to the supernatural, paranormal, or extraterrestrial. 
In fact, the area is so familiar with the unexplainable that it led to a joint investigation between the privately owned company Bigelow Aerospace and the United States government's military, the Department of Defense. Over a period of about 20 years, a joint investigation was made to uncover the cause of the paranormal, supernatural, and extraterrestrial sightings made across the Intar Basin and determine whether or not the cause was a threat to national security. This led to the purchasing of a piece of land that would later be referred to as the Skinwalker Ranch due to the region's massive amount of sightings of a terrifyingly humanoid monster known as the Skinwalker. In his book titled The Hunt for Skinwalker Ranch, co-author George Knapp discusses how the ranch, previously owned by a family known as the Gorman family, appeared to be a focal point of the unexplainable activity. Featuring anything from sightings of little gray aliens, Bigfoot, skinwalkers, dire wolves, unidentified flying objects, and poltergeist activity. Interestingly enough, over the 20 years of investigation, a surprising amount of evidence came forward that would help to explain the previously believed paranormal causes into something far more evident of advanced technologies. As is common with alien abduction stories, many abductees will often claim that evidence of an abduction having taken place is experiencing a dramatic sudden loss of time. A number of witnesses residing within the Intar Basin have claimed to have suddenly been walking through their house at night only to find themselves staring at the clock and noticing huge chunks of time missing from their memory, with others claiming that while they had been driving, they found themselves parked at the side of the road, realizing that they must have been asleep for several hours. What kind of advanced technology, if any, could cause such sudden lapses in time and awareness? During the NIDS's investigation, researchers gathered the witness testimony of the Gorman family, the family that used to reside at the Skinwalker Ranch, and the troubles they faced with the ongoing paranormal and supernatural activity they witnessed. In one such story, the Gormans talked about how their missing cattle had been a devastating blow to their finances and how their last ability to make a profit rested with four 2,000-pound bulls in an iron-gated pen resting a few hundred yards from their home. Almost as if listening in on the conversation, when the couple reached the bull pens, they noticed that all four bulls were missing from their locked pens with no evidence of destruction. After contacting the researchers, the bulls were found crammed into a locked and closed trailer with no way of entering or exiting, with all four of the bulls standing side by side in a perfectly docile mood, seemingly stuck in a hypnotic trance. When the researchers entered the trailer in an attempt to coax the bulls back into the bullpen, almost as if a sudden switch had been flipped, the bulls snapped out of their hypnotic trance and began kicking and breaking the trailer apart in a terrible fit of rage. The researchers were not only unable to explain how the balls entered inside the trailer, they were unable to explain the strange display of sudden behavior shifts in the balls that allowed them to have been moved into the trailer in a docile state before the arrival of the team. Despite this lack of explanation from the researchers, however, Unexplained Mysteries proposes a theory as to the cause of the ball's sudden behavioral shift. Back in 1964, neurological researcher Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado, later referred to as the pioneer of electrical brain stimulation, conducted a dramatically demonstrated research test that could prove the viability and theory that electrical brain stimulation, when applied in controlled manners, could not only manipulate an organism's muscle movements and contractions, but could more than influence the creature's entire behavior as well. Delgado invented a small device that could be implanted into the brain of an animal and used to give remote-controlled electrical stimulation to specific parts of the brain for controlled behavior. After conducting brain surgery to impact his electrode into the skull of a Spanish bull, Lucero of Córdoba, Spain, Delgado got into the bullfighting ring with the creature surrounded by a crowd of onlookers and waited for the bull to charge him. When it did, Delgado activated his remote-controlled electrode only a few meters from being hit by the bull, which instantly caused the raging bull to come to an immediate halt. Almost in an exact instant, the bull seemed to lose all of its aggression and violence and lay down in a calm and relaxed demeanor. Just like the docile behavior of the caged bulls on the Skinwalker Ranch, Delgado's bull seemed to become completely oblivious to the presence of Delgado and went into a hypnotic dull state. Could electrical brain stimulation have been the cause for the Skinwalker Ranch Bulls suddenly becoming docile and being led into a tight and compacted trailer? Oddly enough, the NIDS's research group found that the iron gate that fenced the Bulls in were suddenly completely magnetized around the area. The magnetization of iron was most likely caused from a powerful electromagnetic field in the region of unknown origin. 
This heavily implies, however, that only moments before the bull's strange personality shift, there was a powerful electromagnetic field that suddenly arose and caused the bulls to undergo a specified and controlled behavior. Rather than the paranormal ability of a poltergeist, a conscious intelligence with advanced technologies capable of creating strong electromagnetic fields could have used such technology to apply specific electrical brain stimulation and lead to the docile hypnosis and control of the skinwalker balls, just like Delgado's experiments demonstrated more than 60 years ago. Could it be that when individuals experience a sudden loss of time and undergo hypnotic trances shortly before and after an alien abduction event, they could be the victim of an impossible to explain electrical brain stimulation caused via a powerful but direct electromagnetic weapon used by otherworldly beings? Interestingly enough, another recorded story from the Skinwalker Ranch researchers could prove to be a profound piece of supporting evidence for this claim. One of the strangest pieces of supernatural encounters from the Gorman family was that of the instantaneous cattle mutilation that took place no more than about 20 feet away from them as they fed their livestock. According to the Gorman family, their cattle had been in a small field together with a baby calf resting beside its mother as the cows were being fed. Suddenly, the family claimed that the mother cow began bellowing sadly as it ran in circles with a partial limp that seemed to be a form of temporary paralysis. When the family walked to the cow to see what was wrong, they noticed that the calf had been cut open and picked completely clean with a precision that was more akin to surgical tools. In a few seconds, it took them to walk from the calf down the field 20 feet and then back again. When the researchers investigated the mutilation, they found that the hide of the calf was too thick to have been cut by a knife and would have required surgical tools and a large amount of time to have performed the procedure, leaving behind nothing but an untouched head and a skeleton picked completely clean. Although the family claims that next to no time had passed, could the entire area have that caused a docile hypnosis and temporary amnesia that led the inhabitants into believing no time had passed while an unknown entity conducted a mutilation experiment in the field unseen? The partial paralysis of the calf's mother seems to support that theory overwhelmingly. There are few known scientific causes of temporary paralysis in individuals, but one of the most or misfiring signals from the brain to the nervous system. Similar to how REM sleep will temporarily cause the body to undergo paralysis to prevent an individual from kicking out in their sleep. Could the electromagnetic fields caused by some unknown entity have caused an adverse effect on the mother cow's nervous system that caused it to temporarily enter into a partial limb paralysis when exposed to its radiating field? Countless accounts of extraterrestrial encounters in the past have often remarked that close encounters with alien craft have often led to neurological problems. Could this be evidence of a form of neurological control or influence? Often referred to as poltergeist interference, there seems to be a tremendous amount of evidence of time loss, hypnotically induced trance states, sudden amnesia, and controlled electromagnetic fields capable of manipulating an organism's behavior instantaneously. Rather than a paranormal or supernatural cause, the evidence points to a clear use of advanced technologies that can not only control their victims, but can allow the unknown entities to remain unseen while conducting real-time experiments in front of their victims without them knowing it. Disappearance of Susan Pearson In 1966, a woman by the name of Susan Elizabeth Pearson was last seen in Missoula, Montana and has not been seen since. Miss Pearson, an American woman from Portland, Oregon, went missing due to mysterious circumstances. She had been a graduate student at the University of Montana and was teaching there as an instructor at the time of her disappearance, days she was last seen by her friends on campus, as she was meant to take her business administration exam but never arrived. Likewise, Susan missed two work checks meant for her adding up to $1,200, which were never claimed. Initial searches for the woman were futile, yet when the police checked her apartment, they found it in pristine condition, untouched with not a single sign of struggle. Her car was soon thereafter found completely abandoned. In Missoula's business district, her belongings were still in the car when the police checked it. They found her keys, purse, and other necessities inside, ones that any sane person would never leave unattended. Bones were found in 1970 but were analyzed and found to be animal remains. Susan Elizabeth Pearson is one of the oldest missing persons cases Montana has had in the past century. Curiously, Ms. Pearson was the granddaughter of Walter Pearson, Oregon's Democratic Senator. Susan King, who was one of Susan Pearson's friends and a prominent singer at a nightclub, told the police that she had visited her on the night before her sudden disappearance and that Pearson was in a frantic, nervous state. 
It was just a different Sue, she had stated. A prominent piece of the puzzle was the information King also received. Pearson mentioned leaving her life behind. Begin anew in her frantic state. Later, she added that two delinquent boys from the course she was teaching threatened her with physical violence. Pearson's brother, David, added that it appeared his sister rushed out of her apartment and the tea kettle was left to boil on the stove. Days after her disappearance, there was a report of a sighting in Lolo Pass, but evidence of her actually being there is non-existent. No further sightings were ever. Sheriff Herbert Shermer abducted by aliens. When it comes to aliens, there are two types of people, believers and skeptics. Some wholeheartedly believe in the existence of extraterrestrial beings and that they come from planets in the solar system and travel in what appear to be flying sources in the night sky or otherwise known as UFOs. Others dismiss the idea entirely as a total sham. And then of course, there are those who are stuck in the middle, who do not necessarily believe in their existence but are also not completely shut to the prospect and rather prefer to keep an open mind pertaining to the matter. Whatever side of the alien belief spectrum you find yourself on, one police officer's experience in 1967, Herbert Shermer, may just influence you in that regard. One fateful and otherwise uneventful winter night around 3 a.m. on December 3, 1967, Herbert Shermer was going about his usual policing duties in Ashland, Nebraska. He was patrolling the highways and just so happened to be along the intersection of two intersecting highways, Highway 6 and Highway 63. As he was veering onto Highway 63, that is precisely when something caught his eye. At first glance, it appeared to be flashing red lights on what he thought initially was a truck. However, as he proceeded to get closer and flashed his own patrolling vehicle's lights, he realized he was mistaken. It was not a truck. Rather, what met his eyes was far from what he would have previously ever fathomed. Before him was what appeared to be the classical look of what one would picture a UFO to look like and it appeared to be hovering suspensefully eight feet upward in the air. It had a metallic finish and was circular in shape with three stands extending from the bottom. The red lights he had initially noticed were coming through circular cutouts along the sides of the mysterious vehicle. As it escalated upward into the air, fire emerged from the bottom as the vehicle proceeded to make a siren-like sound. Shermer recalled it going directly overhead his police car before whizzing past and upwards into the night sky until it was completely out of sight. Shermer could not believe what he had just encountered but made sure to make a cursory in his logbook duly noting the time at which the sighting had taken place. What was bizarre besides the actual encounter with the UFO was how Shermer was left feeling after the incident. The sighting seemingly left Shermer with some physical implications. These symptoms included headache, generally feeling unwell, and a red, swollen region marking his neck, all of which were not present prior to the incident, especially not the neck marking. Word of Shermer's strange experience made it to the Condon Commission, a branch of the University of Colorado that had spent some time dedicated to investigating extraterrestrial and UFO encounters. They invited him to come to Boulder, Colorado for some consecutive examinations pertaining to his alleged UFO sighting. Shermer cordially obliged and on February 13, 1968, he consented to a hypnosis session conducted by psychologist Dr. Leo Sprinkle. That had the objective of reflecting back to the night of December 3rd. Through the hypnotic session, Shermer was able to recall more detailed memories of the night that had seemingly been suppressed in his earlier recollections of the night. These details included that as he got closer to the UFO, both the engine to the car and radio went dead. More interestingly though was that although Shermer's previous and initial memories did not recall any encounters with extraterrestrial beings or occupants of the UFO through hypnosis, Shermer was able to recall seeing a white figure emerge from the UFO. Shermer felt that he had experienced a telepathic form of communication from said figure which contributed to him refraining from pulling his firearm out onto the figure. In general, Shermer seemed to speak fondly of the alien figures, classifying them as friendly. Shermer's alleged experience in addition to the new details he relayed are undoubtedly a lot to take in. The overall consensus on the credibility of Shermer's story on whether or not it actually happened was inconclusive. The Condon Commission felt that there was not enough proof or evidence to substantiate the alleged UFO sighting Shermer claimed. Since the only thing that they could go off was his own words and since Shermer was the only witness that was simply not enough to be deemed credible. This is not to dismiss Shermer's claims as lies, however, and conducted the hypnotic session held the belief that Shermer firmly believed in and was fully confident in his claims and that to him they were a true reality. 
In other words, Shermer was speaking his truth. However, whether it happened or not is still up for debate. An eventful dawn at Silbury Hill. Similar to the alien-esque sightings with Sheriff Herbert Shermer, another police officer would have an alien-like encounter. Silbury Hill, which is located in England within the Wiltshire County of Avebury, is not exactly a stranger to the extraordinary. In fact, it has been somewhat of a hotspot over time for UFO connoisseurs and people fascinated by the prospect of extraterrestrial life and supernatural happenings. It is, as its name suggests, a hill, but rather a large one, standing at 131 feet in stature and erected by mankind. The exact reasoning behind it being built is not known, but that does not stop people from entertaining different possibilities, some of which have gone to the extent of hypothesizing that it holds some type of magical element or confines a hidden treasure within. In the summer of 2009, an anonymous police officer who happened to be off-duty at the time was cruising along the A4 highway, which happens to give a decent view of the ambiguous Silbury Hill. It was early morning around dawn when he noticed a crop circle. A crop circle is a term used to describe flattened crops that form some type of shape. What struck the officer as odd was that the crop circle appeared to be fresh. However, that was not the weirdest aspect of it all. The officer realized he not the only one taking notice of said crop circle. He recalled that there were three noticeably tall figures cloaked in white with their faces hidden from view and they seemed to have long blonde hair. Initially, the officer did not think too much of these figures at first, dismissing them as investigators conducting a forensic investigation of some sort. However, as he got closer, he noticed a loud and obnoxious buzzing sound that was audibly impossible to ignore. The figures seemed entirely unbothered by it, however. The officer continued to come closer and even made the daring move of trying to catch their attention by calling out to them, to which he received no notice or response. The officer noted that something strange seemed to be happening from within the crop circle. Not only did the strange buzzing sound seem to stem from within it, but the crops within the crop circle seemed to be moving as if being blown by wind. That there was no noticeable wind in the atmosphere. Everything aside from the crop circle was perfectly still, which further suggests that the crop circle must have been moving due to a factor other than wind, perhaps an engine of some sort. The officer decided to make a second daring move of running towards the figures to which they did seem to take notice, saying that their heads reared towards him before bolting off at an alarmingly supernatural speed. After they disappeared, the buzzing sound was still very much present. That is precisely when the officer got cold feet and decided to return to his vehicle for safety. Similar to Shermer's case, the officer at Silbury Hill experienced an excruciating headache for the whole day after his bizarre encounter the officer submitted a report to his department. However, due to the fact that he had been off-duty at the time of the occurrence, there was no investigations into his claims. Although there were no other witnesses besides the officer himself, or at least none that have come forward, strangely enough there were other uncanny accounts from people who had noticed an odd black helicopter hovering in precisely the same location. It is not exactly the same as a witness account. But what are the odds of a strange unmarked helicopter being at the same spot? Is it pure coincidence or perhaps a subtle confirmation of the officer's extraordinary inco with all of the talk of bizarre alien encounters and paranormal happenings in today's video? Where does that leave you? What is your take on these strange police encounters? Do you see these encounters as purely fictional tales or do you find substance in the claims made by these officers? Sam Heslop Disappearance A British flight attendant called Sam Heslop disappeared on the 7th of March, 2021. Since then, police still have no idea what has happened to her or where she is. The former flight attendant was on the sea sailing with her 41-year-old boyfriend, Ryan Bain. The pair were out in the Caribbean when she went missing at the start of March. Since then, police have been trying to find her. Though Ryan Bain has suggested she fell overboard and drowned, Ms. Heslop's friends and family have demanded a thorough search of Bain's yacht, Siren Song, but Mr. Bain has refused the search of his yacht despite the fact it was the last place where Ms. Heslop was seen alive. Currently, the Siren Song is moored in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Virgin Islands police spokesperson, Toby Darima, has stated that a warrant is required to search the yacht. They cannot search without a court-sanctioned warrant and admits they hoped Mr. Bain would simply allow them, but did not. Ryan Bain has remarked how distraught he is over his girlfriend's absence, but he only reported her as missing over 10 hours from the moment she disappeared. Her family and friends are deeply suspicious of his behavior. 
a lawyer has been contacted by Mr. Bain and when questioned about why he refuses to allow the police to search the he has argued that he exercised his constitutional rights to remain silent. According to Mr. Bain, he woke up at 2.30 in the morning by the catamaran's anchor alarm and that was when he first realized his girlfriend was gone. They matched on Tinder the prior year in July and have been together for a total of eight months. On the night of her disappearance, witnesses have revealed that the couple went out for a dinner at a restaurant and left at 10 p.m., only for a scream to be heard. At around 2 in the morning, the time she allegedly went missing. Much to Heslop's family's dismay, the police discarded the reports of a scream, claiming that there are always noises and it could have been from any one of the vessels in the harbor. Corey Stevenson, Bain's ex-wife, has accused him of domestic violence against his significant others. Sam is 5 feet 8 inches, athletic, brown-haired, and Caucasian. The Coast Guard and Virgin Islands police are on the lookout for her or her body and hope to find some traces of her soon. But her parents have stated that Heslop is a seasoned traveler and thus would have known to avoid mistakes which would result with her falling overboard. Sam Heslop worked in Spain when she was in her late 30s and she has the soul of an adventurer according to her dearest friends. When she and Ryan Bain met, they were allegedly smitten with each other and did everything together deciding to take their vacation to experience adventuring together side by side. Heslop's family and friends are desperately worried for her, but with each passing day, the likeliness of her being found alive dwindles. The world is abundant with horrors great and small. There are mysteries that are fated to forever remain unsolved, never concluded, always merely speculated upon. While it seems that the mystery of Susan Elizabeth Pearson is destined to be placed into the cold case hall of unfortunate fame, whether or not that same fate is to befall Ms. Sam Heslop is yet to be determined. The case is still ongoing and we can only hope that she will be found or that at the very least her family will gain some sense of closure in the near future. And if it turns out that foul play did occur, that justice will be served. The Winchester House Secret Room Winchester House has been a mystery in the making for over a century, built over the course of 38 years with construction beginning in 1884, though the tales and eeriness linger even today. It took nearly four decades to create this masterpiece of a historical building, which is known today for its labyrinth of corridors and rooms. It's no wonder some of them hold rather dark stories. You might think our story begins in 1906 with the tale of an earthquake, an attic, and an heiress. And whilst this is the most famous story behind the ongoings at Winchester, the history has a sad and deep truth leading up to this. Sarah Winchester, who commissioned the house, lost her daughter in 1866, just four years into her marriage. This loss was shortly followed by the death of her father-in-law in 1880 and then her husband in 1881, just one year after. With so many consecutive tragedies, Sarah became convinced she was cursed. She had a life riddled with paranoia and turned to a medium to help find answers, solutions, and explanations. Perhaps not the one she had hoped to hear, Sarah was told that for each life that had been taken by a Winchester rifle, their spirit would return as a ghost to haunt not only the house, but also Sarah and her family. According to some, such as the Smithsonian Magazine, the medium advised that Sarah should move out to California where the Winchester house now stands. The medium allegedly also told Sarah to begin to build a home that would satisfy these spirits, ghosts, and ghouls and alleviate the family curse. Heeding this warning, Sarah left Connecticut behind and began building in 1884 in California. Some speculate that the construction crews worked for 24 hours a day, every day of the week until Sarah's death in 1922. This supposed fact has since been debunked by historian Mary Jo Ignafo, who stated to California Home Design that Winchester's own letters explain that she sent workers away for months at a time. This staggered and strange design process, whether that is continuous labor or months of inactivity, has certainly led to a bizarre set of architectural features within this house, with staircases lead to nowhere, doors with nothing behind, windows that overlook rooms and the seemingly endless maze design. The house reached a staggering seven stories before an earthquake in 1906 knocked the highest three down. Many modern-day visitors have guessed that the confusing maze-like design was intentional, a way to mislead the ghosts and deter them. Perhaps Sarah hadn't heard they could walk through walls. Then again, our more level-headed historian, Ignofo, concluded that the random doors and staircases that we can see today were simply quick fixes to seal off the damage this landmark had seen as a result of the earthquake. During the 1906 earthquake, Sarah became trapped inside the attic room, stuck listening to the winds raging outside. 
Sarah concluded that the spirits were angry, prompting the earthquake as a symbol of their discontent, and her short time in captivity was a form of punishment. She boarded up the attic she had become trapped in and never entered it again. This room remained hidden away for over a century. Before 2016, descriptions of the house detailed 40 staircases, 2,000 doors, 47 fireplaces, and upwards of 10,000 windows. It wasn't until 2016, however, that the attic room was stumbled across despite the lengths of this house being stumbled through countless times. This brought the room count up to a staggering 161. Haunted Mirror Up for Auction There are three ways that you can get to know more about the captain of the Titanic named Edward John Smith. Because he went down with the ship, you, unfortunately, cannot sit down and have a chat with him. However, if you were a time traveler, you could go back and meet him. Another way is by doing a classic internet search to learn more about his life. The last method is by glancing into his mirror. Had left one mirror on his dressing table. Perhaps it was the last mirror he had ever looked into before he left the shores. 110 years later, this antique now is deemed to be possessed by his ghost and was recently up for auction. The first spirit encounter was when his mate took the mirror back home and claimed she could see his face appear annually when it came to the Titanics until somehow ended up abandoned. Then a man named David Smith found it and had it locked in a vault of his for over five years, accompanied by a small handwritten note about the mirror's ghostly past. Finally, the mirror left the vault and was put up for auction. It was a museum from Las Vegas that eventually won the bid, forking out over 2,800 pounds for the rights to own it. Perhaps if you were lucky, you might just be able to come across this mirror for yourself one day upon the next anniversary of the Titanic. As you gaze into the glass, do not expect to see your own reflection. You might just find yourself standing face to face with the ill-fated captain himself. The mystery of the USS Scorpion The USS Scorpion was a United States nuclear-powered submarine that launched at the end of 1959. Part of the Skipjack class, a group of submarines with a new teardrop hull and reactor, it began its service with the U.S. Navy in 1960. It mysteriously went missing on the 22nd of May, 1968 in the Atlantic Ocean, along with its 99 crew members. Interestingly enough, three other submarines disappeared that year from the French, Israeli, and Soviet navies. The Scorpion began its career with a two-month deployment to Europe from Connecticut in August 1960. It returned within a few months and then spent the next two years training along the eastern U.S. coast. The crew specialized in developing and practicing warfare tactics for nuclear submarines. They practiced in the waters near the U.S., Bermuda, and Puerto Rico both as attacker and defender. The Navy sent the Scorpion on a transatlantic patrol in 1964 and a European patrol in 1965. The officers and commanders were praised and earned awards for their merit and achievements. In 1967, the Scorpion was supposed to receive a thorough overhaul. It was to undergo testing and repairs to determine all of its programs functioning. The Subsafe Quality Assurance Program demands an intensive research period that can span for months. However, this was at the height of the Cold War, so there was pressure to cut corners and pass subpar equipment because the Navy feared removing a nuclear submarine out of their waters for too long. Despite its equipment long overdue for repairs and corrections, they reduced the overhaul time and waived their essential requirements to send it back to sea. The Scorpion soon after traveled to the Mediterranean but suffered a few problems with its electrical and refrigeration systems. Now 1968, it was leaving Spain to head home when the Navy ordered it to travel towards Soviet vessels in the Atlantic. And reporting back as they had a guided missile destroyer and two fast nuclear hunter submarines. From midnight 20th of May, 1968 to the following midnight of the 21st, the Scorpion attempted to radio their naval station in Spain. The message failed to get through and reached a post in Greece instead, who then forwarded it. It was short, only stating that they were and conducting surveillance before heading back to Virginia. The submarine never made it back home and was reported late six days after the message. The Navy sent out searches but declared it lost within a month. There were accusations that the Navy had set out on covert investigations the day before it was even supposed to arrive, having prior knowledge of its circumstances which they vehemently denied. Five months after its disappearance, search teams discovered sections of the USS Scorpion on the Atlantic seabed at 3,000 meters, about 740 kilometers southwest of the islands where the Soviets were training. The Navy revealed that they possessed sound recordings of the ship sinking from their underwater listening devices. 
Although they could hear its destruction, they were not able to conclude why it occurred. There are currently many theories, the most popular one being a hydrogen explosion, which from changes in ventilation while going to periscope depth. Others include accidentally activating a defective torpedo that struck its own vessel, a torpedo exploding while still inside its case, or a Soviet attack. The Navy's investigations are inconclusive, but they repeatedly visit the Scorpion to measure and observe any uranium leaking and consequent environmental impacts. Disappearance of Claudia Lawrence Claudia Lawrence was born and raised in North Yorkshire and worked as a chef for the University of York. Lawrence has not been seen since Wednesday the 18th of March 2009 and her disappearance remains a mystery. On that fateful Wednesday, Lawrence left work at 2.30 p.m. and began walking home. On the walk, she was spotted by a friend who offered her a lift and at approximately 2.50 p.m. She was seen posting a letter nearby and then returned home at roughly 3.05 p.m. At around 8 p.m., she texted a friend and accepted a phone call from her mother in which she was described as sounding cheerful and relaxed. When Lawrence failed to turn up for work the next morning, her manager attempted to call her mobile phone but did not receive an answer. At the same time, evidence shows Lawrence's phone was turned on, only to be switched off deliberately at 12.08 p.m. that same day. Lawrence was due to meet her friend Susie Cooper that evening but did not turn up. Cooper thought the behavior was out of Lawrence's character and so contacted Lawrence's father who broke into her flat. The only items that were missing from Lawrence's home were her rucksack, her mobile phone, and her work uniform. This suggested that Lawrence had left for work that morning. The group decided to contact the police and a missing persons investigation began. An appeal was released for any further information on Lawrence's last sightings and led to two reported potential sightings of Lawrence. The first report came from a cyclist who saw a woman who resembled Lawrence with a man at 5.35 a.m. on the 19th at Melrose Gate on Lawrence's commute to work. The second sighting was 30 minutes after this when a commuter noticed a couple who looked like they were arguing outside the University of York, Lawrence's place of work. Additionally, police covered CCTV footage of a suspicious-looking man at the back of Lawrence's house on the evening of the 18th and the early morning of the 19th. The man in the CCTV footage was described as wearing a black hoodie, just as the males in the reported sightings had been. Just five weeks into the investigation, police formally classified the case as a suspected and searches taking place in the investigation, this male figure has never been unmasked. In 2013, the North Yorkshire Police set up a new unit specifically to look into kidnaps and stalled cases. Lawrence's case fell into the latter category. Using new and advanced techniques, the police were able to find additional fingerprints and a man's DNA on a cigarette end in Lawrence's car. The new discovery led to the arrests of six men, however, none were charged. With no conclusion to the case, the two main theories of what happened to Lawrence are that she absconded from the UK or she was abducted and killed. The first theory that Lawrence absconded is based on the knowledge that Lawrence had visited Cyprus on five occasions before her disappearance. The last text message on her phone had come from a male friend in Cyprus. This had led some to conclude that Lawrence chose to disappear of her own accord to the Mediterranean islands. However, when the police extended the search for Lawrence to Cyprus, no further information of her whereabouts was revealed. The second and dominant theory is that Lawrence was abducted and killed. On a crime watch program focused on her disappearance, Detective Superintendent Ray Galloway revealed that some of Lawrence's relationships had an element of complexity and mystery to them that were not known to her family or friends. Despite her family and friends publicly refuting the claims, some began to suspect that Lawrence had fallen victim to foul play from one of her scorned lovers. This is supported by the fact that police interviewed every male regular of one York pub as to whether they had a romantic relationship with Lawrence. Others argue that it was convicted woman killer Christopher Hallowell who is responsible for Lawrence's abduction. Hallowell abducted and killed his second known victim exactly two years after Lawrence's psychological research has shown that killers are triggered often by dates. So Lawrence's disappearance would fit into his offending pattern and there is one reported sighting of Lawrence and Hallowell together. Lawrence's own mother believes Hallowell is responsible for her daughter's disappearance. She has publicly criticized the police for not spending more money and time investigating whether Hallowell was responsible for the crime. Over 10 years later, what happened to Lawrence remains unanswered. Brown Mountain Lights on North Carolina's Brown Mountain, ghost lights can sometimes be spotted. 
Reports of these mysterious lights have been referenced since 1910 when electricity was first introduced to the area. George R. Mansfield, a scientist, proved that the lights were trains and car headlights in 1922 and yet some storytellers claim that the lights predate electricity. The story, as many tall tales of the past, changes depending on who is telling it. A man by the name of Joseph Lovin claimed to have seen the first light in 1897, but claimed he did not speak to anyone about the strange occurrence until 1910 when C. Gregory outwardly spoke of the lights. It is important to note that in 1909, the Southern Railways started using increased candle power of 600,000. This made their lights brighter than even certain lighthouses. Strangely enough, however, the lights were reported as being red in color and described by the Charlotte Daily Observer as mysterious lights seen just above the horizon every night. Despite the belief that the lights were caused by trains when the Southern Railways had to cease sending trains around the Brown Mountain area due to flooding, the light sightings continued. The lack of locomotives did not stop the peculiar red lights. According to Joseph Lovin, a true Brown Mountain light was one that appeared to move in brightness and flare. However, once Mansfield proved that the lights were, indeed, man-made, Joseph Lovin ceased any commentary about the Brown Mountain lights for the rest of his life. In 1938, in the Asheville Citizen, there was an article about the lights as a phenomenon for Native American legend. Something that was challenged as having been invented by white Americans as a way of proving the supernatural existence of the lights. Originating from the mystery of the Brown Mountain lights include that of a mother and child from the Jonas Ridge community fatally injured in cold blood. This was also the first frightful tale written about the light directly in 1936, but all sorts of Brown Mountain light ghost stories were born throughout the 20th century, such as the story of the revolutionary soldier from 1982 that was made popular again in 2012, when stories linking the lights to civil conflict spirits spread around the internet. Some believe the lights to be caused by extraterrestrials. Ralph Lale, a self-published UFO author, wrote a book about his alien occurrences on the mountain, including finding mummified remains of an alien. According to Lale, the aliens of Brown Mountain took him to Venus in 1965. In modernity, ghost hunters are often drawn to the lights that are still visible to this day. There is several roadside locations for the lights, including the Brown Mountain Overlook and the Green Mountain. Fire aboard the Titanic you have just heard that the reason the Titanic sank was because of an iceberg. Well, what if that was not true at all? What if in fact the ship sank because of fire instead? This is exactly what one Irish investigative journalist called Sinan Maloney claims to have happened. After doing in eth research for more than 30 years, he believed that a fire had caused the ship's hull to weaken. In other words, what could have been a small iceberg collision turned into a major disaster because of the damaged hull along with criminal negligence? What had apparently taken place was that a fire, allegedly burning since the ship had launched from the Belfast shores. It smoldered on for four long days before it was put out, yet the damage had already been done. The once strong steel was now weakened and more brittle than ever, nearly 1,000 degrees Celsius. The iceberg was the tipping point that completely shredded the hull apart, letting the cold Atlantic waters inside. Maloney never believed that the 300-foot gash would have come from a small graze alone. In his documentary called Titanic, The New Evidence, he explains how the ship's hull had various dark and mysterious marks in several auctioned photographs. What were these marks? Rocks. Apparently no one had ever investigated them before. He claims that the fire was greatly downplayed at the time. No one even bothered to think that the fire could have been the whole root cause of the catastrophe that took place. Part of the reason why that might have happened was that Maloney speculated that people were too eager for the Titanic to launch. Because it had been delayed more than once, it was easier to overlook a small fire. However, Maloney believes that given the fire, the ship should have never set out to sea. Perhaps if people had taken the time to study those marks and delayed the ship one more time, the maiden voyage would have been successful. However, it was human error and the hand of fate that played a cruel twist in the mystery of the Titanic. Joshua Maddox Joshua Maddox was a normal 18-year-old who lived in the Pike National Forest in Teller County, Colorado in 2008. He loved nature and hiking, so when he left to go on a walk one day, nobody thought anything of it until he failed to return that night. His disappearance sparked searches all over the area for months, hoping to uncover Josh safe and sound, or at least get some answers as to what might have happened to him. However, he was never found and continued to be listed as a missing person for years. 
In a seemingly unrelated course of events in 2015, a builder who owned an old decaying cabin in the woods that had been abandoned for over 10 years decided to demolish it in order to begin developing the land that it stood on. Before demolition, the builder came out to check that everything was in order and entered the cabin for the first time in many years. He noticed a smell of rot and decay in the cabin, but attributed it to the many animals who made the decrepit building their home in the intervening years. However, when demolition began, starting with taking apart the chimney to reuse the bricks, workers were horrified to discover that there was a body of a young man inside the chimney, which was likely the source of the smell. The police and coroner were called to investigate and remove the body and his dental records as the body of Joshua Maddox. Maddox was found in a fetal position, with his legs curled up under his chest and his feet above his head, leading investigators to hypothesize that he might have gotten stuck in an attempt to enter the abandoned building and explore. Although the coroner agreed with this guess, as the autopsy did not reveal any trauma or suspicious substances and ruled the end of his life as accidental, there are those who disagree. Heavy metal grate covering the chimney had disappeared and a heavy breakfast bar had been forcibly removed from the wall and dragged in front of the chimney to cover it. Additionally, many thought it was odd that Joshua would have voluntarily entered the chimney head first and his clothing was found folded inside of the cabin next to the fireplace. He had only been wearing a thin thermal shirt when he entered the chimney. Despite several tip-offs and leads claiming that Joshua was finished off, the police were never able to determine what had actually happened and the case remains a mystery to this day. Man claims to have escaped from Alcatraz. Most people know of an escape attempt from Alcatraz. The subject of one of cinema's most famous movies, the 1962 escape has been shrouded in mystery from the get-go. The three men involved, John Anglin, Clarence Anglin, and Frank Morris were inmates at the penitentiary for their involvement in a bank robbery. Through their ingenuity, the trio showed the world that the high-security prison was not escape-proof after all. Supposedly, the men dug a small tunnel out of their cells using sharpened spoons as their only tools. The effort took months to complete and the men crafted a raft out of their raincoats and set off on the choppy San Francisco waters in the middle of the night. Despite their escape, the men were never seen again, leaving many to wonder if any of the escapees made it across safely. For decades, people have argued for and against the survival of the three criminals, with many believing that the swim across the bay would have been impossible for the three men to complete, yet people do swim the journey today. However, in 2018, an interesting development came to light thanks to the San Francisco Police Department. In 2013, the San Francisco television station KPX received a letter from an unknown sender claiming to be from the prisoner John Anglin. The now public letter is an incredibly interesting read, as it includes some closure on the famous mystery if it is to be believed. It begins with, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. The letter goes on to explain what happened to the other two inmates. According to the letter, the other Anglin brother, Clarence, passed away in 2008, while Frank Morris passed away in 2005, supporting the idea that the trio lived on into old age. That said, the letter is not all positive. John Anglin goes on to state that he has cancer and also tries to bargain with the police in exchange for medical care, stating that, if you announce on TV that I will be promised to just go to jail for no more than a year and get medical attention, I will write back to let you know exactly where I am. While somewhat bone-chilling, the letter's authenticity has obviously come into question. It took the police five years to make the existence of the letter known to the public, and it was sent to the FBI for analysis on authenticity. Interestingly, in comparisons between the handwriting of the three inmates to that of the submitted letter, the results were inconclusive, according to the U.S. Marshals. Relatives of the Anglin brothers stated that they would find roses supposedly left by John and Clarence for years after their escape, including their signatures. So what could it be? Is this letter just some prankster with too much time, or could it be the last contact made by one of the United States' most wanted men? The Vela incident The Vela satellite is located near the Prince Edward Islands in the Indian Ocean. It was constructed as a reaction to the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which ensured that nuclear reactors or explosions could not be tested anywhere due to the deadly and detrimental effects of nuclear energy. The Vela satellite is able to detect nuclear explosions and send signals to intelligence agencies to warn them of the presence of dangerous and illegal nuclear energy. 
The Vela satellite is equipped with technology that can detect X-rays, neutrons, and gamma rays by using Bang meter sensors. It is an extremely advanced piece of technology and essential for both human and environmental safety. On September 22, 1979, the Vela satellite detected the infamous double flash indicating that a nuclear explosion had occurred. This detection on the satellite is now commonly known as the South Atlantic Flash. The flash lit up the sky not only once, but twice and was remarked as an incredible natural event. However, the true cause of the double flash remains a mystery. The United States and other countries alike predicted that the Valor satellite flash might have occurred due to natural phenomenon such as a meteor crash or lightning strike. To investigate this further, meteorological technology was introduced into study but was this technology was unable to prove the exact cause for the detonation. However, it did show that a wind had occurred over the southern Indian Ocean that might have carried nuclear explosive radiation or chemicals to certain parts of Australia. After an investigation from the United States Department of Defense within the Indian Ocean and surrounding countries, they predicted that it is possible that a nuclear test had occurred within the region of South Africa or Israel. But there was not enough evidence to conclude that a nuclear threat was present. There are several conspiracies as to why the Valor satellite detected a nuclear explosion. Investigators believe that the United States might be covering up the reality that Israel and South Africa might have access to nuclear power and that they might be working together to create nuclear weapons. These same investigators claim to have evidence that the United States Department of Defense came across conclusive evidence. That a nuclear explosion from these regions really did occur, but that they chose to ignore it to not draw attention to their international conflicts with the region. Recognizing that Israel and South Africa might share in nuclear power is a dangerous idea for the United States. There are certain ulterior motives for the United States to disguise this information from the general public. However, upon further investigation into South Africa's nuclear power industry, officials believe that the South African government could not have made such a powerful nuclear explosive within the time frame that it went off because their access to nuclear power at the time was limited. South Africa was also a part of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Because of this, they allowed foreign parties to view their classified documents revealing the kind of nuclear access they had. Because South Africa seems clean on its own, it gives precedent to the possibility that they collaborated with Israel to test this nuclear explosive. The United States has yet to confirm or deny this possibility. Disappearance of Mel Wiley Police Chief Mel Wiley was last seen on July 27, 1985, on a date with his girlfriend in Hinckley Township, a suburb of Cleveland. His car was found on July 30th at Lakefront State Park on Lake Erie in Cleveland, Ohio. Police performed a thorough search of the area and found no sign of Wiley. After searching his car, which was still locked, they found his wallet with $15 in cash, his police ID and badge, some sunscreen, a pack of cigarettes, and a beach towel. After performing an investigation among Wiley's friends, family, and co-workers, authorities ruled out the possibility of foul play. Wiley left work early a lot and seemed moody in the weeks before his disappearance. His friends believed that he had grown tired of his job but did not think anything of it. He had always wanted to retire at 50 so he could write full-time, but he ended up disappearing three years before retirement. In his spare time, Wiley wrote poetry and was a thriller mystery novelist. Before his disappearance, he was writing a novel about a homicide in Pennsylvania that he often spoke of to anyone that would listen. When police entered Wiley's home, it was spotless and he had also left several days of food and water out for his two cats. After an extensive search through his belongings, his thriller manuscript was nowhere to be found. Other missing things were stamps, envelopes, his music collection, typewriter paper, and an address book. Most of his long-sleeved shirts were missing, which he frequently wore to cover the burns on his arms that he had suffered while serving in the military. The only thing left in his fridge was a jar of mayonnaise. The police later found out that his desk at the police station was empty as well, except for a key to his apartment. At this point, it was as if Wiley had merely vanished into thin air. But after picking up his dry cleaning, police found the first of many strange clues. Located in the pocket of his police uniform were bus schedules from Cleveland to San Francisco. Wiley had written a letter to a female friend before his disappearance. He had expressed that he wanted to disappear and was tired of his life in Hinckley. The letter stated that he would be 2,500 miles away when his friend would receive his letter, roughly the distance between Cleveland and San Francisco. 
Police were able to decipher the letter by looking at the ribbon on his office typewriter. Investigators were never able to track down the original letter and it appears that the friend never received it. As a police chief, Mel had access to all he would need to form a new identity directly at his fingertips. With access to a database of fingerprints and social security information, it is entirely possible that Mel leveraged his years in law enforcement to facilitate his disappearance. With his military background and several years in law enforcement, he would also know how to stay off the radar. Mel was the only suspect in his own case. He was declared legally deceased in 1993 per Ohio law, once he had been missing for five years. Mel could very well be enjoying his remaining years writing poetry and novels on the West Coast today. Having a passion for writing mysteries, Wiley's most tremendous story appears to have been the one of his own disappearance. Gabriel Nagy sometimes people go missing and are never seen or heard from again, leaving their families to conclude, after years of waiting, that they must have met some unfortunate end. This appeared to be the case with Gabriel Nagy, who disappeared from Sydney, Australia one afternoon in 1987. A devoted husband and father to two children, Nagy was an incredibly hard worker who supported his family by working successful construction jobs while attending accounting classes at On That Fateful Day. Nagi had spent the morning running errands in town and called his wife Pamela to let her know that he was on his way home for lunch. Pamela got his lunch ready, but when he did not return after several hours, she became increasingly worried and that worry turned into outright panic when Nagi's car was discovered on the side of the road. The car was burned and Gabriel was nowhere to be found. His distraught family was left to wonder what had happened and where their father and husband two weeks after his car was found, Nagi withdrew money from a bank in Newcastle almost 100 miles from Sydney, confirming that he was out there somewhere and still alive. However, no other clues or leads turned up for over two decades and his family had long ago lost hope that they would ever see him again. Finally, during preparations to declare Nagi officially dead after being missing for so long, a police officer combing public records one final time noticed that a man of the same name who also went by Ron Saunders had appeared in medical records from a recent surgery. The officer traveled to the location of the surgery in a town called McKay, almost 1,000 miles from Sydney, and tracked down Nagi at last. It turned out that he had developed disassociative fugue as a result of the crash, resulting in retrograde amnesia that caused him to forget about his life prior to the accident. With no idea who he was, spent the intervening years mostly homeless, wandering from city to city. He called himself Ron Saunders because he had seen a sign for Saunders Beach during his wanderings and, not knowing his real name, thought that it sounded nice. After his discovery, as he read letters and saw pictures from before his accident, his memory slowly began to return in hazy pieces and he was reunited with his family. Although he and his wife and children still live separately, his family is all supportive of Nagi as he navigates this new life that he was unaware that he even had and begins to rebuild the relationships with those who had believed him dead for 20 years. The chilling disappearance of Sammy Berlka vacations are supposed to be abundant with family fun and timeless memories, but for a certain family, a would-be exciting trip turned into a living nightmare. Sammy Berlka was an 8-year-old boy and the son of Kenneth Berlka. When talking about his son, Kenneth described him as a passionate but stubborn young boy who was on the high-functioning side of the autistic spectrum, which resulted in Sammy being easily overwhelmed by brightness and sound. The boy stood at 4 feet and 11 inches in height and weighed an estimated 85 pounds. He had dark eyes and brown hair cut in a short hairstyle. The family was staying in a cabin near Diamond Lake when the tragedy occurred. He disappeared in October. The Berlka family had prior camping experience and Sammy grew up learning important survival tricks, but no amount of teaching could ensure a vulnerable child's survival in the vast wilderness of Oregon. Kenneth and Sammy went out to play a game of either tag or hide and seek at around 4 in the afternoon. The reason for this roadside game is unknown and Kenneth's motives have since been suspected as impure. The father and child played until Sammy spotted a radiant shade of yellow peeking out from the ground believing it to be gold. Due to the autumn period, it was already getting dark and Kenneth wanted to go to their cabin, heading off to the cinder slope where they had been playing moments prior. As Kenneth Berker went to his car, he assumed his son would follow, but he did not. Instead, Sammy vehemently refused to leave or even step off the cinder slope and began running away from his father when he tried to chase after him. It is assumed that Sammy believed Kenneth was just playing with him. 
After the fact, Kenneth stated, I never caught up with him and at that point he disappeared over the top somewhere and I lost him. After Sammy's disappearance, it was reported over 200 people helped with the area's search for the boy, traveling and combing a total area of 4,000 acres. An entire week passed by with trained dogs and even the use of helicopters, but it was to no avail. Never again would Sammy be seen by anyone. Kenneth's story has been criticized by police and speculators alike. It seems suspicious that a young autistic boy seemed to suddenly run from his father and disappear in plain sight by running straight into the wilderness without any other witnesses. However, no proof of foul play was ever discovered. The Cape Intruder, Cape Elizabeth, Maine Hay. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and felt like someone was watching you? Well, if you lived in the town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine in 2005, that may very well have been the case. In this small town of only 9,000 people, residents felt like they knew their neighbors and it was not uncommon to leave their doors unlocked. That summer, residents of the small town that did not lock their doors at night reported that there would be a man in their room when they would wake up in the morning, staring at them as they slept. Every time the man would flee the house before the victim would even react. They never reported any damages. No one was ever harmed and there were never any tragic accidents. The man did, however, take any feeling of safety these people once felt in their homes. While they were never injured or robbed, it did not make the situation of a stranger looming over them as they woke any less terrifying. After the local news showed a rough sketch of a young man who appeared to be in his early 20s, the police received a ton of leads from people who thought they knew the man, but the police never did catch the Cape intruder. The break-ins continued through the fall and into February of the following year before they just stopped. It is not known whether the intruder grew bored of the activity or simply moved on to another town. If there is one thing to take away from this story, it is to lock your doors. The disappearance of Bessie and Glenn Hyde On November 18, 1928, Bessie and Glenn Hyde set out for their extended honeymoon, where they planned to float down the rapids of the Colorado and Green Rivers for a few weeks. They said goodbye to Ellsworth and Emery Kolb, two brothers that were also spending time in the area. The couple departed on their boat to begin their exciting adventure, but they were never seen again. It has been nearly 100 years since the Hyde's embarked on their honeymoon and mysteriously vanished. Colorado River guides still tell ghost stories about the couple's disappearance when sitting around campfires because no one knows what happened to them. Although they were on an adventure honeymoon, it didn't take long for their family to notice that something was wrong, and then soon contacted the authorities. Glenn's father launched a search on December 6th. They were not even considered overdue at their final destination in Needles, California, but his father somehow knew that something was wrong. On December 19th, their flat-bottomed boat was abandoned and discovered floating in the river by a search plane. It was discovered about three weeks after their initial disappearance and was located around River Mile Marker 226. The boat was in perfect working order, with no signs of destruction or overturning. There were also no clues signalling what could have happened to the couple. Interestingly enough, the hide's gear and supplies were still found aboard the boat, securely strapped in and undisturbed. Authorities even found a camera on board with their last picture taken around River Mile 165 around November 27th. Search teams and investigators had trouble with this case because there were no signs of disturbance, technical difficulties, violence or tracks leading away from the river. It was as if the couple simply vanished into thin air. Bessie did make a note in her journal though that they cleared River Mile 231, leading many to believe that they had at least made it past Mile 226, Diamond Creek, where they set up camp for a night. Additionally, Glenn was an experienced boatsman, having spent years operating and handling river rafts before their trip. He was considered an expert boat builder and managed their raft entirely on his own. He spent much of his life aboard rafts on the Snake and Salmon Rivers in Idaho. Although he was not a professional captain or entirely familiar with the surrounding area, he was not an amateur at risk of making simple, yet fatal mistakes. The leading theory for their disappearance was that their journal was self-sabotage because the couple felt massive amounts of pressure from their friends and family. They intended to set a record for the speed and duration of their boat trip through the Grand Canyon, plus 
Bessie would become the first woman to boat the entire way through successfully. This pressure to do well and succeed could have caused them to either make mistakes or purposefully fail themselves. However, authorities found no evidence on the boat or surrounding areas to support and prove this theory. One historian believes that they were most likely swept overboard when their boat hit one of the many submerged rocks in the rapids that lie near Mile 232. The granite rocks often capsize and damage ships, causing many accidents every year. The Hyde's boat, however, shows no sign of distress or damage from stones. In 1971, an older woman was sitting with a group of rafters in the Grand Canyon and announced she was the long-lost Bessie Hyde, having escaped the canyon after taking the life of her abusive husband, Glenn. After authorities contacted her, though, she recanted the statement and denied ever having said it. Famed river rafter Georgie Clark was speculated to be Bessie after she passed away in 1992, and authorities found some documents like Bessie and Glenn's marriage certificate in her possession. There were even skeletal remains discovered in 1976 that people assumed were Glenn's. However, it was proven by the University of Arizona to be a different man. There have been strange stories and theories surrounding the couple ever since they first vanished in the late 1920s. Their story has inspired many writers and artists, spawning novels, a musical, and even an episode on Unsolved Mysteries. To this day, no one knows what happened to the Hydes, and we most likely never will. Robert Horahan's disappearance Unfortunately, some disappearances do not have the happy ending that René Campine was able to experience. Robert Horahan is one of these cases. He has been missing for a decade, leaving his heartbroken wife and family with no answers and nothing to do but wonder at what might have happened to their beloved husband and father. After leaving for work in the family's Chevrolet Cavalier. However, when he never returned from work that evening, his wife Tara immediately knew that something must have gone horribly wrong. Robert was fiercely devoted to their daughter and would never have left her, not to mention the fact that he took the life-saving heart medications and would have had to have taken them with him if he had intentionally left his family. Once the missing persons report was filed and police launched an investigation, officials discovered that Robert had last used his phone at 7.41 that morning in Palmyra, Virginia, and had also been seen at the grocery store in Palmyra at around 8 a.m., while not necessarily strange that he visited a grocery store before heading to work, what struck Tara as odd was the fact that Palmyra was the opposite direction from his work. Additionally, investigators discovered that Robert did not even have work the day that he left and was supposed to meet with a friend instead. But he never showed up to the meeting. The case then went cold until his car was discovered in a parking lot in La Plata, Maryland, over 100 miles from Palmyra. The car contained some of his work tools and a work shirt, but his phone as well as anything that could indicate where he might have gone was missing. Video footage of the parking lot revealed nothing helpful and it took so long for the car to be discovered that the footage of the car being parked had already been taped over. So officials do not even know exactly how long the car had been sitting in the lot. Since that day no more leads have been discovered in the case. Police suspect foul play and hope that since so much time has passed there might be someone who knows something about the case who would come forward. Tara has had to spend the intervening years as a single mother raising a daughter who hardly even remembers her father and the family has not even been able to receive closure in the case. The case is still open and ongoing as officials hope to one day be able to offer a little bit of peace of mind with the family in the form of some answers as to what happened to Robert after he disappeared all those years ago. The unsolved disappearance of Thomas Nutzi. Thomas Nutzi's family has been searching for him for the last decade after he mysteriously vanished on June 18, 2001. He was last seen by friends three days prior and was finally reported missing after failing to show up to work in Bethel, Alaska on the 19th. The last image of him was taken on the 18th at a gasoline station near the Super 8 Hotel on Minnesota Drive in Anchorage, where he was staying. Authorities found a receipt that showed Nutsi had purchased chips, soda, two lighters, and a pack of cigarettes at the gas station at 9.47 p.m. He was never seen or heard from after this. 
Police believe Nutsi was on foot when he disappeared since his Jeep Cherokee was found 12 miles outside of the city at the Alpenglow ski area in Chugash apparently on June 15th. A woman and another man attempted to break into Nutsi's car at the hotel as reported by a security guard. The woman was also captured on the surveillance camera standing next to Nutsi at the gas station. On his last known day, the same couple was once again spotted breaking into the Jeep. This time, the man was successful and drove off with the car. The following day, the day Nutsi was reported as missing, a housekeeper of the hotel saw a man on Nutsi's hotel room floor. When she came back later in the afternoon, the same man was sitting on the bed. He was not Nutsi and she made him leave the room. Police considered the couple as persons of interest to the case but have not been identified or seen since. The woman is small, about 5 foot 2 inches and 105 pounds, Caucasian with medium long dark hair and possibly in her 20s. The man is dark skinned, tall, thin and has decaying teeth. They are suspected of having used Nutsi's phone since all the recent calls on his phone were traced to unknown numbers. Many of the numbers are connected to motels, pages and a halfway house. Nutsi's nephew called back every single call, missed, dialed, or received, but none of the people who answered him had ever heard of his uncle before. Despite an extensive search for clues by authorities, they were unable to turn up any evidence or leads to Nutsi's disappearance. He lived a quiet and reclusive life, working as a registered nurse and often traveling around the state for his employment. Because of this, he did not even have a permanent address and opted to live out of hotels. He has never been seen since that day and his case remains unsolved. Craig Freer in 2004, a high school student from New York went missing at just 17 years old. The young lad had been visiting a friend where he was consoled about a recent breakup. Whilst he had clearly been upset about him and his girlfriend, he reportedly did not give any indication that he may run away, nor did he say anything to suggest he would cause himself harm. This seemed a run-of-the-mill teenage breakup least until leaving his friend's house and walking into the woods. He never arrived back home. Adding to the distress in the boy's life, the day of his disappearance his parents found out he lost his part-time job at the Price Chopper supermarket weeks prior. Craig had been pretending to show up and complete his shifts so that his parents would not find out he had been let off. His wallet and $40 in cash were found in his bedroom, just one of the reasons authorities do not believe Craig ran away or left off his own will. He had not applied for a job in the U.S., opened a bank account, or paid taxes since he was last seen, evident through the lack of activity surrounding his social security number. Craig lost his driver's license before his disappearance and did not get another before he went missing. Craig did not have a criminal record, any known behavioral issues or enemies. He was in fact a popular bright student, went in high school and had plans to study elementary education at college. However, before he went missing, some friends and family described him as acting secretive. Furthermore, Craig had run away once before, though only for a night as an early teenager. Sixteen years on and there continues to be a Facebook group searching for him, with friends and family actively looking for him. To this day, Craig Freer's case remains open, unsolved, and with no new leads. Timothy Tim Barnes' disappearance The USA's national parks are notorious for mysterious disappearances. There are literally hundreds of missing persons cases across practically all national parks in the USA. United States national parks have had many disappearances in which the circumstances are so mysterious that there have been entire groups and websites set up to try and solve these mysteries. The Missing 411 is the name given to the group of people that have disappeared in mysterious circumstances in national parks, large rural areas, or a large reserve. What is bizarre about the missing 411 is that these disappearances take place in busy national parks with a lot of foot traffic, so for someone to disappear in these busy areas without a trace is mysterious. So we are going to be talking about a specific disappearance that has been classified into the missing 411, and that individual is Timothy Tim Barnes. Back in July 1988, Timothy Barnes left his California home at around 9 a.m. and had initially planned on hiking the Polydome Lakes of Yosemite National Park and returning home later the same day. After he did not return home that evening, his friends waited until the morning to report him missing and informed Yosemite Park Rangers. Over the next seven days, an extensive search of the area was carried out. There were over 70 people, a team of dogs, and two helicopters. It is very hard to believe that after that amount of time with that many resources that there was not one shred of evidence relating to Timothy Barnes. 
The fact that absolutely nothing was found is bizarre. The reported area in which Timothy Barnes went missing has been an area in which at least three other people have reportedly disappeared. Without a trace, this has led to people labeling the area a hotspot and have pointed out a geographical correlation between these specific disappearances. Teresa Gibson disappears from the Great Smoky Mountains. On October 8, 1976, Teresa Lynn Gibson, also known as Trenny, went on a field trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. She traveled with 35 to 40 of her classmates from Bearden High School in Knoxville, Tennessee. Despite being surrounded with a group and other hikers, 16-year-old Trenny mysteriously disappeared from the park. The field trip was odd to begin with. There were almost 40 students, yet only one teacher to supervise them, plus the bus driver. According to some students, they were not even informed of their field trip destination until they arrived at the park. Only then did they find out that they would be hiking about 1.8 miles from Klingman's Dome to Andrews Bald and then returning to the Forney Ridge Trail. When students began their hike, they split up into smaller groups based on their walking speed. Throughout the day, Trenny walked at different paces with various groups of classmates. However, at some point in the afternoon, she mysteriously vanished. She was last seen by classmates near Klingman's Dome at 3 p.m. They were hiking along a fairly steep trail with thick vegetation and sudden drop-offs. Apparently, she glimpsed something on the right side of the trail and left the path. That was the last time anyone saw her. The weather and fall foliage made it difficult for search and rescue to use helicopters and inspect the trail. Instead, they used tracking dogs to pick up her scent. There were around six teams of bloodhounds and German shepherds that searched and picked up her scent near the juncture of the Klingman's Dome Trail and the Appalachian Trail. They followed her scent past Klingman's Dome Tower up until a mile and a half from Newfound Gap. The scent then disappeared along the roadside. Multiple theories have arisen, and suspects investigated. Some believe Trenny was in Klingman's Dome Observation Tower while the initial search was being conducted because it was never inspected. Once the search is left, she traveled to the roadside where she got into a car, either voluntarily or against her will. There are some reports of cigarettes and beer cans found along the roadside. Trenny's classmate Robert Simpson was implicated as a suspect since her hairbrush was discovered in his car. Police quickly dismissed the idea. Trenny's parents, Robert and Hope Gibson, informed the police of a previous break-in by a young man whom Mrs. Gibson shot at. After being shot, he threatened to hurt their daughter. Although the authorities investigated this man, there were no leads for them to follow. Searches were conducted extensively through October and then again from April 18th to May 5th, 1977, but to no avail. Searches resumed in 1981 as well, but they never found anything. Kim Pouncey, a friend of Trenny's, gave an interview in November 2017 for an episode of Appalachian Unsolved where she expressed her doubt of an abduction. She believes Trenny left of her own accord and had someone waiting for her in the park that she had planned it because she wanted to leave and get away. After so many searches, the rangers of the National Park were convinced that she was not in the park. Her body was never found. There are no current suspects, leads, or evidence. It's strange that a young girl could vanish while on a popular trail in the middle of the day surrounded by people. Whether she orchestrated her own disappearance or was kidnapped will remain a mystery. Geomagnetic fields and pyramids. Much to the shock of many modern people, Teotihuacan had advanced technology for its era with professional engineering. Elaborate tunnel systems beneath pyramids and even something akin to an ancient generator that combined mineral and chemical waters into built-in chambers that created natural sources of energy. We are not sure how the energy was used and delivered, but it shows that the people of Teotihuacan were significantly more intelligent than other civilizations of the time. Sergio Gomez, an archaeologist in 2003, found a hidden tunnel beneath the temple of Quetzalcoatl. Recent heavy rainfall made the cracks in the tunnel open up and expand, revealing it on the surface and creating a noticeable divot large enough to potentially cause harm to unexpecting visitors touring the city. Because of the potential for injury, Sergio Gomez inspected the cracks further. It was then that he realized it was actually a tunnel. Because of the antiquity of Teotihuacan, archaeologists are wary of the fact that artifacts could be hidden in plain sight. Every movement must be careful lest it destroys some vital information of the reality the Aztecs lived in. Every stone and pebble may hold a vast history. After he received permission from the INH, short for National Institute of Anthropology and History, Gomez proceeded to investigate with a team of other professionals who helped him remove surface debris. 
The excavation was tedious and slow, but eventually Dr. Gomez was lowered into a well shaft 14 feet deep that opened up into the tunnel's cavern. The main goal was to search for artifacts, but they found the main access point to the energy complex that proceeded to go down over 40 feet. Over 400 tons of debris had to be cleared for them to access the area properly. Laser scanners revealed that the cavern went a shocking 330 feet below the surface of the pyramid and had small room chamber-like pockets cut carefully into the sides of the cavern's main shaft. Before even getting into digging, the archaeological team immediately found a plethora of artifacts and fantastic discoveries of tools left behind by ancient builders, were evidently experienced and knew exactly what they were doing. In total, over 50,000 artifacts and classical tools were found in the cavern shaft making the modern archaeologists consider the potential for a royal tomb to lay somewhere either in or near the tunnel. Furthermore, there was proof of water markings in the tunnel and proof of the mineral energy generator that was suspected to have been used in the city by the ancient people who lived there. There were also various mineral sediments within the ground itself. The gravel held traces of chemicals thought to have been used to generate the energy. The electromagnetic energy present in these caverns shows a professional level of precision. These natural mineral chemical generators are present throughout all Central America and Mesoamerican lands, showing that this was relatively common knowledge for the various people who once lived there. Mundo Perdido and Quetzalcoatl pyramids all have these electromagnetic signatures and charges. Archaeologist Burke commented on the voltage found at these sites. These voltages might sound lethal and if it were a household current they could be. However, static electric charge in the air is a different type of electricity and even a thousand volts is not dangerous. The science remains unknown to us, just out of reach. Where have South Africa's Great Whites gone? False Bay and Gowns Bay are two bodies of water off the coast of South Africa that are hotspots for Great White Shark activity. However, in recent years, the sightings have all but vanished. Scientists quickly grew concerned at the sudden disappearance of the water's regular inhabitants and research quickly began to determine the source. According to the publication Munga Bay, white sharks were a very common sight in False Bay, just one of the two bodies of water of interest. From a write-up, Shark Spotters reports that between the years 2010 and 2016 there were an average of 205 sightings a year. But in 2018 that number reduced to just 50 sightings. Not one sighting occurred in 2019. Thankfully, one sighting did occur in January 2020, the first in 20 months of zero activity. The reality is that we have way more theories than we have facts to support them at the moment, says Alison Cock, a marine biologist for South African National Parks who has been researching white sharks in Africa since 1998. Great white numbers are uncertain in South Africa. Some estimates have put the population total at 500, while others suggest 900. Regardless, the number is hardly indicative of a thriving species. Sarah Andriotti of Stellenbosch University studies the genetics of white sharks around the South African coast. Andriotti's research has uncovered that sharks around the coast are actually just one group which moves from location to location, breeding with one another. In her study conducted from 2009 to 2011, Andriotti believed to have identified 300 breeders in the population. The minimum to avoid inbreeding is 500 and according to Andriotti, our population was in real trouble already. So why did the Great Whites suddenly disappear from the South African coastline? Well, the answer might lie in the shark's pop culture cousin, the orca whale. Orcas are also present in the bodies of water that Great Whites normally thrive in. Scientists have identified two particular orca whales named Port and Starboard, which were first spotted in False Bay in 2015. Orcas have slowly increased their activity in the area since 2009, and at this time the number of deceased broad-nosed Sevigil sharks began to show up in the waters off the South African coast. Alarmingly, these were the first records of orcas hunting sharks in South Africa. A paper was published on the first documentation of a nuffle feeding technique. Succinctly, the orcas had been using brute force to damage the shark's pectoral girdles. This allowed the orcas to bite out the shark's livers before leaving the rest of the carcass. Orcas do this because livers are incredibly high in fat and shark livers equal roughly a third of each shark's body weight. After the first attacks, the Sevigil sharks soon dispersed from the area. Despite being one of the world's biggest hotspots in activity for Sevigils, the sharks were gone for a month. This pattern seems to match up to the Great White events post-2017. 
As the Great White sightings began to lower, a total of five Great Whites were found washed up on the coast of Gansby, each of them missing their livers. The evidence of large teeth marks clearly pointed to the local orcas. While Port and Starboard were the only present orcas in the bay, researchers have given word of another orca in the area, resulting in continued drops in sightings. This behavior might point towards a different ecotype of orca, one that is primarily a shark eater. Reasons for this behavioral adaptation could stem from water temperature change due to climate change as well as overfishing. David Stone David Lawrence Stone was a 29-year-old stock market analyst from La Jolla, California. It is of note that he sought spiritual guidance through the New Age movement, a range of beliefs focusing on the mind, body, and spirit of its followers. This knowledge was a pointer that gave authorities more information when they later discovered his tracks through a desert in New Mexico and traces of related clues and hints that he may have intentionally left behind for them to find. Stone was known for having anger and control issues and these problems became worse just three days before Halloween of 1988. After a significant outburst and loss of control, Stone told his family and friends that he needed some time away. The morning of that Halloween he drove off, not telling his close loved ones where exactly he was going. What happened next was determined by investigations and a report by Sheriff Bill Cavalier, the investigating officer in the case. It was said that Stone walked into a desert about 145 miles east of Tucson, Arizona from where he just kept walking. He walked so far that he got from Arizona to New Mexico where a farmer discovered him and approached him surprised at seeing a walking tourist in such a far and rural area of New Mexico. When asked about the encounter later, the farmer told investigators Stone told him he was looking for what he called the beast. Other locals and residents also noticed Stone, reporting that he had been walking alone, muttering to himself and acting extremely strange. Around the 5th of November, Stone's car was found abandoned along an empty stretch of the New Mexico Highway 80, south of Road Forks, New Mexico. Stone's family believed him to be on what a journey taken for one's self-discovery and understanding of him or herself. This belief was reiterated by many clues discovered later, thought to have been left behind deliberately by Stone. Symbols like that of pyramids and strange numbers were related to certain New Age beliefs. Searchers found a pyramid of rocks surrounded by a triangle besides a watch belonging to stone and two quarters. Later, for the Venic numbers, which are digits used often by stock market analysts, were found written in the sand. Notably, there was a mistake in the numbers. Stone had written 18 instead of 21, which some people thought hinted towards his jersey numbers from when he had played football in college. Although it was a mere coincidence that Stone disappeared on the day of Halloween, it still adds to the mystery and fear around this case. To this day, no one knows why he was acting so strangely. And what exact happened? The case was unresolved until four years later in February of 1992 when it was discovered that Stone had passed away. His skeletal remains were recovered in a desert near Granite Gap, New Mexico, the same area where several clues were found years before. His identity was confirmed by medical records and there was no medical evidence of foul play in his passing. To this day, no one knows when, how or why Stone passed away. That part of this unfortunate case still remains a mystery. The mystery of Marion Lynn Carver in 2004, Marion Lynn Carver took a vacation cruise liner from Seattle, Washington to Vancouver, British Columbia. She boarded the ship on August 27 but was last seen by her cabin attendant the next day. She never got off at any of the four stops along the way and did not board her return flight home to Boston, Massachusetts. She has been considered missing since then despite years of her family searching for Carver was a 40-year-old single mother to one daughter. She had secretly booked a celebrity cruise trip for herself and left without telling any of her family members. Her father first reported her missing on September 7th after her daughter called him asking for her mother's whereabouts. The police only realized she had left for a cruise after looking into her credit card records. The cruise line never reported her missing despite constant memos from her attendant. Had not been slept in on the first night but was ordered to ignore it and clean the room as usual. He submitted five notices to his supervisor about Carver's absence but was told that someone else would handle it. The supervisor gathered Carver's belongings but did not attempt to notify police or search for the missing passenger. The cruise line only reported Carver's disappearance after her father reached out to them. By then, the supervisor had already donated most of her possessions and only kept her purse and documents in storage. 
As per the cruise line's regulations, missing passengers must be reported. So Celebrity Cruises immediately fired this employee. Nonetheless, the cruise line was unhelpful in the search for Carver. They claimed her disappearance was most likely due to jumping overboard and did not attempt to investigate. It took nearly a month from her first disappearance for the family to learn that she had booked a cruise and an additional three days for the voyage to confirm that she was a passenger. Despite pleas from the father and personal investigators, Celebrity Cruise barely helped in the investigation. They claimed to delete surveillance footage after a few days even though they kept it for 30 days. When the father asked for it, they ended up accidentally deleting the footage. He ended up hiring private investigators to try and figure out what happened to his daughter, spending over the next few years nearly $75,000. Carver's father had so much frustration with the investigation and cruise line that he ended up suing the company over her disappearance and lack of action. He founded the International Cruise Victims Organization in 2006 and constantly lobbied Congress to enact laws and regulations to hold cruise ships responsible for accidents and loss of life. He became the leading campaigner for cruise ship safety, initiating the Cruise Vessel Security and Safety Act of 2010. Ronald Wilson Reagan Public Policy Award from the U.S. Department of Justice in 2017 for his work. Despite all of his hard work and dedication to the safety of cruise ship passengers, he never learned the truth of what happened to his daughter. Carver's father died in December 2019 at 83 years old with her case still unsolved. The disappearance of Robin Graham with all respect, the disappearance of Robin Graham is quite literally a Hollywood horror story. The 18-year-old disappeared in November 1970 on the Hollywood freeway in Los Angeles. As the investigation unraveled, things began to get really quite spooky. Graham had been out partying that fateful night and had been dropped back to her car by a group of college friends. After setting off home, her car stalled near the Santa Monica off-ramp on the freeway. Police officers on their regular loop stopped and offered to call a tow truck for Graham, but she declined the offer and explained she was going to a phone box to call her parents to come and pick her up. After completing the loop, the officers stopped a second time to check in with Graham, where she explained she'd caught her parents. Satisfied, the officers drove on. The officers drove past Graham one final time around 2 a.m., but did not stop this time as they saw her with a dark-haired man, estimated to be in his late 20s, who they presumed to be the family member that Graham had contacted. The officers also observed Robin seemingly willingly climb into the man's car and drive off. This was the last time that Robin Graham was ever seen. At around 2.30 a.m., Graham's parents arrived at her car to find it locked, empty, and abandoned. Robin Graham was nowhere to be seen. And the patrolling officers who had seen her drive off explained to her parents that, in line with protocol, they had not intervened. Investigators quickly began to link Graham's disappearance to a series of chilling abductions of young women in North California in the few years before the incident. After reading the Los Angeles Times coverage of the disappearance, a woman came forward to the authorities with an eerily similar story to that of Robin Graham. She explained that she had been stranded on the Hollywood freeway earlier that same night when she was approached by a man driving a light blue Corvette who claimed that he was an off-duty policeman and offered her a lift. She refused the offer and was later to identify the stranger that she and possibly Robin had spoken with as a man named Bruce Davis. Davis had a sinister backstory being heavily linked to the Manson family, a murderous cult in California. However, the police were more interested in Bruce Davis, suspected of being the deranged Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer haunted North California between 1968 and 1970. In truly sadistic, Jack the Ripper style, he would haunt the press with cryptic messages expressing his love for killing humans. The killer was known to strike on the full moon. In a supernatural twist and like many of the killer's victims, Robin Graham disappeared on a full moon. Whatever happened to Robin Graham, a very clear message emerges from the events on the November 15th, 1970. Never accept a ride from a stranger. So there we have three spine-chilling roadside disappearances. The fact that they occurred on busy highways makes them even more sinister and perhaps more difficult to accept, given their very public location. Roads connect us to our loved ones and lead us to places full of memories. For some, memories of their loved ones are all that the victim's families are left. John Briska's disappearance sometimes even fame cannot protect you from the horrors of the world as was the case with professional basketball player John Briska. 
Briska was an American NBA player playing for the University of Toledo and then moving on to the Pittsburgh Pipers, Pittsburgh Commodores, and Seattle Supersonics. Although a skilled player, he quickly gained a reputation as an explosive and volatile athlete. His teammates reported being frequently frightened by his aggressive, occasionally threatening demeanor, and his willingness to pick fights even during a professional game earned him the nickname the heavyweight champion of the ABA. In one game, he was ejected for fighting after only two minutes and attempted to charge back onto the court so many times that he was threatened with arrest unless he went to the locker rooms for the remainder of the game. He was an excellent player, but say something wrong to the guy and you had this feeling would reach into his bag, take out a firearm and shoot you. Remember Charlie Williams, one of his teammates with the Pittsburgh Condors. It might seem difficult for such a blazing fiery 6 feet 5 personality to simply disappear without a trace, but that is exactly what happened to Briska. In March of 1978, after he had been out of the NBA for three years and his career seemed to be winding down, he embarked on what appeared to be a business trip to Uganda. He had a one-month-old daughter with his girlfriend and was interested in establishing a more stable way to provide for his family through launching an import-export business. He called his girlfriend, who was still in Seattle, on April 11th, and that was the last anyone ever heard from the former NBA athlete. Authorities have virtually no information to go off, although Brisker's former teammates and fans have spawned many legends and rumors based on the belief that he might have become a mercenary that met a bad end or had got involved in the Ugandan coup. However, the truth is that nobody has any idea what really happened to him. Although he was declared deceased in order to settle his estate, it is not even certain that he ever arrived in Africa at all. His communication during his absence was spotty and lacked any information that might have helped authorities in either country locate him, and a spokesperson for the FBI in Seattle has said that essentially we don't consider him deceased. The case has been cold ever since, and the lack of even one single lead has been incredibly frustrating for those hoping to receive some closure regarding the fate of the former star. The mystery behind the disappearance has garnered a small following and many individuals have spent countless hours attempting to track down Briska, but it truly appears that he vanished without a trace, meaning that he either perished somewhere in Uganda or is alive and well somewhere in the world but just does not want to be found. Jason Jalkowski's disappearance June is the favorite season of many people. The midsummer is the perfect time to unwind. Jason Jalkowski was doing just that when he picked up the phone. Jason, 19 at the time, was called by his boss from the restaurant he worked at asking if he could come in early. Jason was described as a hardworking man, but a hailstorm damaged his car and prohibited him from getting to work as he worked four miles away from his home. His boss organized for a co-worker to pick him up at the local school, but he never made it to meet with the co-worker. After 15 minutes of waiting for him to arrive, Jason's co-worker called their boss to inform him he was not there. She returned to work another 15 minutes later. Jason never came to work. Jason's family came home and found him still missing. The family searched for their son. Jason was a religious teenager and not the running away from home type, an honor student at his old school. He did, however, have a mild disability when it came to slurring and speech. He was in financial trouble and required jobs to keep afloat. Jim and Kelly, Jason's parents, were convinced that something disastrous must have happened. He never skipped work and was not with any of his friends either. The following morning, his family reported him as missing but the police refused to help, telling the parents that the teen likely just went out with friends for the weekend and would surely return. The family and friends of Jason went looking for him, putting up posters and even having news of his disappearance run in the local radio station. By this point, the group of Jason's loved ones were certain he was hurt, if not fearing the worst. No news of his whereabouts ever turned up, but it forced the police into action and although it was belated, they gave the investigation their all, but by then it was too late to find worthwhile evidence. There was no evidence at all. Simply vanished. No clues to follow. Two weeks from his initial disappearance, the police got word of a boy with his description seen at the Mahoney State Park, but found nothing to prove he had been there. The family did everything in their power to find their son, with Kelly even beginning the organization Protect Jason to raise awareness. Now, 20 years later, his case continues to baffle investigators. Jason lacked funds to leave and begin a new life, nor was he the kind of man to do so. He also planned on working that day and his car was being repaired. Since he went missing, his bank account and social security number have remained untouched. 
His family refused to believe the theory that he took his life due to his religious faith and he was an upbeat individual who presented no sign of sorrow. They believe to this day that he was taken and someone had ended his life. With nobody ever found, disappearances are one of the hardest things families have to go through. Hope can be both a blessing and a curse. People disappear every single day with cases sometimes forever remaining unsolved. Others can be solved decades afterwards, but the only certainty is uncertainty. The Unexplained Disappearance of Larry Jeffrey On May 28, 1966, a young six-year-old boy named Larry Jeffrey vanished from the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest in Nevada. He was wandering with his brothers near the peak of Mount Charleston, just a quick drive from Las Vegas at a 12,000-foot elevation. He happened to wander off from his family and was never found. Investigators say that there were no predators or cars around to take him, so he essentially just walked off, never to be seen again. After his family reported him missing to the authorities, they organized a full search and rescue with nearly a thousand volunteers. Even the National Guard assembled to assist in the search for the boy. They spent 16 days looking for him, managing to catch his trail a few times, but ultimately came up empty-handed. They discovered that he had eaten insects and berries along his walk, but could never actually find him. Searchers were surprised that they even found signs of his existence and foraging since he was wearing light clothing when he went missing. They had believed he would not survive through the cold night wearing such little protection from the elements, but he managed to last for a few days before his trail went cold. Larry was partially deaf too, which could have played some role in his disappearance. Perhaps he wandered off from his two stepbrothers and could not hear them calling for him in the woods. He was never found despite hundreds of volunteers searching up and down the mountain for weeks. Disappearance of Paul Braxton Fugate Similar to the previous entry, the disappearance of Paul Braxton Fugate is also part of the missing 411. Born in 1938, Paul was a park ranger at Arizona's Cherokee National Monument and a dedicated one, too. He was known for answering visitors' questions and making different plant lists and trail guides. On January 13, 1980, at around 2 p.m., Paul set off on a trail. He had told an aide that he was going to do a trail and that if he wasn't back by 4.30 p.m., they should notify the relevant people. At approximately 8 p.m., the National Monument superintendent was notified and him, along with two others, carried out a quick search but to no avail. The following morning, the county sheriff's office was notified and a search team of 22 people and a dog set off to search for Paul. After two weeks, official search and rescue operation was called off. Paul's partner, Doty, has continued to organize volunteer searches for Paul years after his disappearance, but not a shred of evidence relating to the case has been found. Then, in 2017, a retired detective decided to start investigating the cold case by going back around the area and re-interviewing witnesses and sources. That same year, there was a new lead and the park itself put a special agent on the case. But, same as before, the lead turned cold. In 2018, the park raised the reward for information to up to $60,000 from the initial $20,000. The case is still open and the relevant people are continuing to investigate the disappearance of Paul Braxton Fugate. There have been many theories and speculation in regards to what actually happened to Paul and where he could be, but as of right now, his whereabouts remain a mystery. Brandon Lawson in 2013, father of four Brandon Lawson, went missing. His case captured the attention of the public and online speculation grew. For years, Brandon had been a dedicated family man with his four children and fiancée, Ledessa. The 26-year-old was an oil field worker, often working up to 95 hours a week. Despite the family-orientated attitude, he did have a criminal past. Brandon had a run-in with the law and a bench warrant due to his substance use. He spent time behind bars but had been using again in the run-up to his disappearance. Home from a long shift on August 9, 2013, Brandon and his fiancée had a row. Ladessa was angry at him not returning home and with his substance abuse, whilst Brandon is described as having been in panic mode. He quickly left, claiming he was driving to his father's three and a half hours away. Ladessa, concerned about his state of mind and unsure if he was high at the time, called and asked him to instead walk to his brothers, believing him to be unfit behind the wheel. We do not know if Brandon intended to follow his fiancé's advice or not. He did switch his route from Highway 277 to Highway 67, though he could have decided back roads would keep him out of the way of the police. Running low on gas, we know Brandon stopped to top up on his way. 
and called Brandon's brother, Kyle, seeking his help. Kyle and his girlfriend arrived at Brandon and Ladika's home at approximately 12.10 a.m. Not long after Brandon had been on the road, he too tried to reach Kyle, telling him he needed gas brought to him as he had gotten stuck on Highway 277. With broken service and speech slurred, presumably due to substance abuse, it was tricky to make out Brandon's message, though Kyle thinks Brandon told him he was 10 minutes up the road to hurry up and said that he was being chased out of town. Kyle's first impressions were that stimulants had resulted in paranoid hallucinations, though Brandon insisted he was not. Ladessa left a gas can by the front of the house for Kyle to take, then went to bed with her phone left charging elsewhere. She awoke to multiple, unanswered calls from both men. When Kyle and his girlfriend found Brandon's truck, he was nowhere to be seen, and a police car was seen accompanying it. The police car followed a call made from an onlooker concerned about the truck being a hazard to other vehicles, though this is not the only 911 call that had been made that evening. Brandon himself called 911, requesting police in a manic and slurred call. He claimed people were chasing him into the woods, that he was bleeding, and some even believe there is another voice and firearm shots in the background. Recordings of the 911 call went viral and online strangers took to trying to decipher the message. No dispatcher was sent. Many believe his life was taken from him with his claims to both Kyle and the police of him being chased, the reports of blood and his requests for the police and the alleged second voice on the 911 call. However, investigators found no blood at the site. Some think he ran away, possibly avoiding the police for his substance abuse, trying to keep out of prison. However, he had already served time and was not afraid to be back behind bars. Some dismissed this theory as he would have been looking at a short sentence and was already working with an attorney facing the felony charge. None of his friends nor family believed he could leave his children. Finally, why would a man running from the police call 911? Perhaps the most common speculation is that Brandon was high, hallucinating, and paranoid. That he hid to escape his hallucination and passed away in hiding. This seems to be the assumption Kyle holds. We may never know what happened to Brandon Lawson on that August night in 2013. Whilst it is truly devastating when it happens, there are millions of missing persons cases worldwide. Hopefully we find a concrete answer and hopefully it is positive news. George Allen Smith IV disappeared on his honeymoon. George Allen Smith was only 26 years old when he set out to a honeymoon aboard a Royal Caribbean cruise ship with the love of his life, Jennifer. What was supposed to be an adventure of a lifetime filled with everlasting love resulted in pure disaster. As soon as their ship, the brilliance of the seas, was sailing in waters between Greece and Turkey, the newly wedded groom disappeared overboard. The captain believes it was an innocent accident. However, Smith's parents believe in their minds George Allen Smith's life was taken from him and was not an accident. Immediately, they set up a $100,000 reward for whoever could reveal anything about a perpetrator. Yet there was more evidence and circumstance to consider before any formal declaration could be made. A ruckus of drinking and gambling was ensuing at the casino. That was not even half of the story. A passenger who was staying next door to Smith believed he heard intense arguing on the Smith's balcony that same evening. Another passenger claimed that they heard furniture moving. Later, Jennifer was found completely passed out in the hallway. Early in the morning, other passengers snapped photos of what they believed to be mysterious bloodstains on the lifeboat canopy beneath the balcony. But nothing was especially worth incrimination until a video featuring four men surfaced to the Smith family attorney. While passing the camera around, the men comment about Smith's death and flash gang signs, yet none of the men ended up being charged. It is not surprising that they denounce having any involvement with the case. Believing the case was just a pure untimely accident in the end, the FBI in Connecticut dropped the case, much to the family's dismay. What further angered the family was the fact that all of the Smith's boat belongings were going to Jennifer, who had remarried since the accident. In a Facebook post, they expressed their anger about how her whereabouts during his death was unknown and that she was trying to stop them from finding out what really happened that day. The suspicions about her were never pursued. Many years later, we still do not know what happened on that fateful day of the 5th of July, 2005. Was it a murder? Or was it an accident? Perhaps we will never know. Missing man found inside Spanish dinosaur statue. Of all the places you would expect to find a body that has already passed away, maybe the last place you suspect would be inside a dinosaur. You're not just talking about any average dinosaur, though. 
This departed man of interest was found specifically inside a papier-mâché dinosaur statue placed outside of a suburb in the bustling city of Barcelona. How could this man's body have found itself inside a Stegosaurus art project exactly? The police authorities in Catalonia are not exactly sure. However, their best guess is that the 39-year-old dropped his cell phone inside the statue, attempted to retrieve it, and ultimately fell into his demise. What is interesting is that he was not found right away. That might suggest that during his time of departure no one else was around. If he was ever reported missing, then a dinosaur statue probably would not be anyone's first guess as to where he was. Was actually found later on by the senses of two visitors as they looked on at the sculpture. What the father and son pair found most intriguing was not the beauty of the artwork, but the bad smell that seemed to radiate from its contents. They decided to look in closer to see what the smell was. Within the cracks of the statue, the father suddenly noticed a body. Right away, he contacted the authorities. It turns out the man that had passed away had already been authorities ultimately ruled out any foul play. They believed the departure from this life was purely accidental. He most likely dropped his phone, entered into the statue's legs head first, and got trapped. Regardless of how sad the loss of life might have unfolded, firefighters were sent to the scene to cut open the art project and remove the body. At the moment, it is still unclear how long the body had been sitting in there, but there is no doubt that it had been a couple of days at least. However, one thing is for sure, the next time you visit the suburb of Santa Coloma de Graminet, you will not see a Torstegosaurus in your midst. Zach Baggins and the Conjuring House Ghost hunter, TV presenter, and all-round creep-loving guy Zach Baggins has been surrounded by ghouls and ghosts for most of his professional life. The host of the show Ghost Adventures, Baggins also owns his own haunted museum in Nevada. Despite becoming accustomed to the spooks of the underworld, Baggins reportedly isn't immune to the effects that his area of interest has on people. Dubbed the modern Ed and Lorraine Warren, Baggins paid a visit to the legendary Harris Field Farmhouse in Rhode Island, which is the real-life setting for the Conjuring film franchise. The original owners of the home, depicted in the films, spoke of how the Warrens knew that they had their hands full when they entered the farmhouse to investigate alleged incidents of possession and poltergeist activity. When Baggins entered the farmhouse to explore it himself, things began to go wrong. Baggins allegedly began to complain of chest pains and dizziness, as well as difficulty breathing. Baggins declared himself unwell and described how he just didn't want to be around anybody. He insisted that he didn't feel possessed and how he would know what that felt like. He described his feeling as if something was drawing life out of him into some sort of entity or atmosphere. Baggins, the Warrens, and others have all felt a strange and eerie presence in the Harrisville farmhouse and it could well be one of the most haunted places in America. The Disappearance of Aaron Hedges Originally from Bozeman, Aaron Hedges was a hunter and along with his friends, Joe DePew and Greg Leitner, they ventured to the Crazy Mountains in Montana in September of 2014. Equipped with two horses and a mule, the group of three's initial plan was to spend a week around the Cottonwood Lake Trail and create a base camp at Campfire Lake. Well prepared, Aaron was armed with a bow and arrows and a handgun. His fellow hunters, Joe DePew and Greg Leitner, carried rifles. On September 3, 2014, the hunters set off. Despite being well prepared, the mule that was carrying their supplies was spooked and ended up throwing their supplies off the trail. It's important to note this included Aaron's sleeping bag. It wasn't until the 5th of September that Aaron decided he should try and replace his lost sleeping bag and set off with a plan to shelter within the group's hunting camp from their trip the year before and recover a cache containing a sleeping bag. However, Depew and Leitner insisted he return to camp before nightfall. As at night, that area can become dangerous and Aaron agreed to return to camp that night. Aaron would not return that evening. At around 4 p.m. that day, Joe and Greg tried contacting Aaron via their walkie-talkies. These were Garmin walkie-talkies and it actually displayed each of their GPS positions. Aaron's GPS position showed that he was going the complete wrong direction and he was heading northeast. Unfortunately, this would be the last time they saw Aaron's GPS position. After Aaron had still not returned on the 6th of September, Joe and Greg had come to the assumption Aaron was indeed missing. This was further unsettling when, on the 7th of September, a snowstorm swept through the area plummeting temperatures and unleashing at least 18 inches of snow across the area. Despite this realization, it wasn't until the 8th of September that Aaron was reported missing by his wife. Aaron's friends insisted they didn't report him missing because he was experienced in the area and also armed. 
the Park County Search and Rescue was tasked with finding Aaron and Corporal Greg Todd, who was in charge, spoke of how this lack of urgency was strange and that he wouldn't have waited as long as Joe and Greg did to report Aaron missing. Due to a aforementioned snowstorm making it practically impossible to search on foot. However, eventually dog and horse teams as well as 59 ground crew along with the National Guard and helicopters joined the search for the missing Aaron. It wasn't until the 9th of September the search and rescue teams finally had a breakthrough. Aaron's boots were found along with a water container and a nearby fire pit was found too. This was it though. There was nothing else in that area. His search and rescue had swept the same spot the day before and had found nothing. Furthermore, given the severe cold weather, it seems very strange that Aaron would take his boots off and leave them. He wouldn't have made it very far without them either. This was the only hard evidence until the 22nd of September when officials involved decided that the search and rescue presence be reduced awaiting additional information. There was no breakthrough in this case until an Roger Bislanovich stumbled across Aaron Hedge's backpack and clothing whilst visiting family. The bag contained Aaron's gun and driving license along with his bow and clothing. It appeared that smaller animals had been trying to get into the bag as small holes were present all over it. It was then on August 8, 2016 that at a nearby ranch, trailgoers found a human skull. With this new information, law enforcement in the area began a full-scale search on the and managed to find most of Aaron's skeleton within just a 70-yard area. Aaron's cell phone was found on his body, but despite best efforts, it was too corroded after spending two years outside on the trail. This case is mysterious for many reasons. Given the route it's believed he took, it's not understood why he went this way. After all, Aaron was an experienced outdoorsman and this was a route he should have avoided. That where Aaron was found was within view of nearby buildings and not too far from a road, why didn't he seek help? Though it's believed Aaron didn't go for shelter due to not wanting to get caught for trespassing. The Black-Eyed Children of Canuck Chase The Black-Eyed Children are contemporary legends, first referenced in American folklore. If you've never heard of them, you would probably be wondering what and who they are. However, this eerie entity seems to be anything but human. Some think that black-eyed children are creatures of the supernatural and it's reported that they are often found hitchhiking or in strange places alone. In 2014, the residents of a small area of green countryside and quaint villages in Staffordshire, England allegedly had an experience with these strange beings. Lee Brickley, a paranormal investigator from the local area, received a letter from a resident of the area who believed she'd seen a black-eyed girl in Canuck Chase. The investigator took one look at the description and immediately realized that their specific sighting had occurred before in the area. However, this was 30 years earlier. Lee released a description which his own aunt provided of the girl she'd seen in the 1980s and locals immediately drew comparisons between the two figures. He described his aunt's encounter, my aunt was only 18 years old at the time. In the summer of 1982, herself and a friend would frequently meet on Canuck Chase in the evenings. An evening just before the darkness approached, we heard a small child hysterically yelling. We couldn't work out whether she was in danger or not. Nevertheless, rushing to find the elves, we stumbled upon a footpath and caught sight of a girl about six years old sprinting in the opposite direction. When they caught up, the girl turned around and stared into my aunt's eyes, then proceeded to run off into the pitch-dark woodland. She described her eyes as being entirely black with no trace of white. A police search was conducted but was unsuccessful. At the time, no one had any reason to believe anything paranormal was going on. The girl certainly appeared to be of flesh and blood. The latest description of the black-eyed girl of Canna Chase was provided by a woman under the name of Mrs. Kelly. My daughter and I were walking through the Birches Valley, an area well known for its impressive sightings. However, we stopped in our tracks when we heard the screams of a young girl. They undoubtedly gave the impression they were in a state of turmoil. However, they sounded close, therefore we immediately started to run towards the noise. Unsure of the whereabouts of the child, we stopped to catch our breath and tried to relocate where the noise was. That's when I turned around and saw a girl stood behind me. No older than 10 years old, she had her hands over her eyes like she was scared or hiding something. I asked if she had been the one shouting. She then put her arms by her sides and opened her eyes. That's when I saw they were completely black. It was like looking into the state of nothingness. I jumped back and grabbed my daughter. I blinked and the child was gone. It was strange and bizarre. Lee Brickley, the investigator, believes that black-eyed children like those found in Kanach Chase are actually demonic beings and exist for evil purposes. 
He also recognizes that of many of the sightings of black-eyed children, it seems as if the creatures are leading others towards some sort of danger. One thing has been recognized, the Canuck Chase sightings are the only sightings that occur during the daytime. Whether these sightings are false or actually credible, we do not know. However, you definitely wouldn't want to stumble across a black-eyed child at any time of day. The account of Antonio Villasbo is one of the first documented accounts of an alien abduction several years before the reported alien abduction craze of the 1960s was from a man known as Antonio Villasboas. As the documented report details, Antonio claimed to have been violently attacked by extraterrestrial life on the night of October 16, in 1957. According to his report, Antonio Villasboas' a strange red light appeared in the sky. At first, he believed that it might have been some kind of previously unseen star or perhaps a stray meteor. But then the red light began to grow in size and quickly turned out to be a strange unknown aerial craft that landed in his field a few hundred feet away from him. Scared of what the craft could have been, he tried to drive away with his tractor but found that the engine had suddenly died. Forcing him to run from the vehicle through the field only to be grabbed by a number of small humanoid figures wearing gray coveralls that dragged him into their spacecraft. While in the spacecraft, Antonio Villasboas was stripped of his clothes and forcibly covered from head to toe in a strange gelatinous compound that forced him to remain calm and nullified him. He was then led into a room where the extraterrestrials pumped in a strange gas that led Antonio to believe that he would soon suffocate. And a strange female humanoid alien entered the room of whom was also completely naked. Antonio then detailed a terrible sexual violence against him that caused him to feel terrible shame. Shortly after, he was escorted off of the craft and would go on to suffer from terrible radiation poisoning and sickness that would have required Antonio to have gotten hit by direct doses of radiation equal to the amount that would later be experienced at the Chernobyl incident. Antonio's tale, featuring forced restraint, sexual violence, and terrible radiation poisoning tends to point towards further themes of alien abduction accounts in the modern day that lead many to believe that extraterrestrials are far more evil in nature. Hampton Court Ghost Located in the borough of Richmond-upon-Thames resides a palace that has been considered the most haunted place in England for the past 400 years. Known as Hampton Court Palace, this palace has had more than its fair share of hauntings, gathered evidence, and strange sightings that continue even to this day, dating as far back as the early 1500s. According to old legal documents back in 1537, the wife to Henry VIII would give birth to the king's only son, Edward, at the Hampton Palace residence. Unfortunately for her, the complications of Edward's birth would cause her to pass away shortly after the incident while still on the palace grounds. Given the nature of the king's violent past and the abuse faced by the wife, it was believed that her soul is still trapped on the palace grounds and can be seen as a wandering ghostly apparition carrying a lighted taper. Additional ghost sightings were made following the execution of Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, back in 1541, after the Queen was charged with treason on the grounds of adultery with her cousin Thomas Culpepper. Shortly after her execution, numerous sightings had been made at the Hampton Court Palace that spoke of a wandering ghost without a head. Although many of these stories sound as if they are from the distant past during a far more superstitious era, in recent years, even more ghost sightings with pictures and evidence to match have been made surrounding Hampton Court Palace. One such story is told by the security personnel of whom detailed that back in 2003, during a winter storm, three fire doors were being opened with tremendous force and causing the alarms to go off. When security tapes were reanalyzed, the image of a ghostly figure is seen opening and closing the doors across the palace. The UK's Bigfoot Bigfoot is a mythical ape-like creature who walks on two feet much like a man and supposedly inhabits the Pacific Northwest of America. Yet in recent times Bigfoot sightings seem to have migrated from the states across to the UK. Bigfoot has reportedly been spotted in a few different locations across England and also in Northern Ireland. In fact, Bigfoot enthusiast Adam Bird, aged 31, was recently investigating a supposed Bigfoot hotspot in a Lincolnshire nature reserve with his team and the British Bigfoot Research Organization. The group, who seek evidence to prove the existence of Bigfoot, felt they were being followed the entire time they were on the reserve and said that it was as if somebody was watching them. Adam took multiple photos that day but had not noticed anything odd whilst taking them. It was only when he flicked back through them that he noticed a strange figure lurking in the woodland overgrowth. 
He described it was a dark silhouette figure similar to a man stood within the trees, facing myself and my team. I make no claims of this mysterious figure, but my fellow investigators think this could be genuine evidence that the British Bigfoot organization has waited for. Another British Bigfoot researcher named Deborah Hatswell is also convinced of Bigfoot's existence. She created a map that pinpointed all the sightings of Bigfoot in the UK. Bigfoot appearances have been spotted everywhere. Practically every country in Britain has seen some form of Bigfoot-like creature. Everywhere in the world has its own stories and the UK is no different. Bigfoot, the black-eyed children, and the black cats of the UK have inspired generations of storytelling, myths, and legends amongst Britons. Whether these creatures or beings are real or not, they definitely make or sufficient stories to be told for many years to come. England's Black Panther Sightings Residents of Devon will know the ghostly legend of the Exmoor Beast, a phantom panther or puma that prowls the moors on the coast. Those in Cumbria will know of the Beast of Cumbria and locals in Warwickshire will be familiar with the wildcats spotted in that part of the country. However, these aren't the only places in the UK where Black Panthers have been sighted. In fact, Sussex, Cornwall, Gloucestershire, Cambridgeshire, and multiple locations in Scotland have all seen large cat-like creatures leaving residents to wonder. What are these animals and where do they come from? Norfolk has by far the most sightings with around 60 different accounts of people spotting large cats in the wild. Earlier sightings of large cats are actually fairly credible in the UK, especially around the 1980s. In the mid to late 20th century, it was known that rich landowners were keeping large cats such as panthers, lynx, and pumas in illegal captivity. In 1980, a puma was actually captured alive in Scotland and was taken into captivity as its owners previously weren't allowed to keep wild beasts as pets in their back gardens. The first sightings of large cats reportedly came between 1770 and 1920, but these were few and far between. However, it may have been slightly more normal for Britons to see black cats roaming the wild in those 100 or so years. Many affluent citizens kept wild and obscure animals in the Victorian era as a symbol of wealth or as prizes won in strange competitions. And when these animals naturally became harder to handle than the average mongrel, they were simply set free into the countryside. Now, Britain's natural countryside isn't quite the right place for a big cat to thrive given the amount of livestock on farms across the country. These cats often choose things like sheep as their prey, which then causes conflict with farmers leading to sightings and cat mania. Some of these cats have been reported to have markings of Eurasian lynx, which were once a common sight in the UK until mass hunting effectively contributed to their extinction around 700 AD. Yet some believe that these cats never became extinct and rather lived in hiding, creating offspring over enough generations to make the lynx a credible answer to panther sightings in the UK. Naturally, people have also made up conspiracy theories about the panthers that have reportedly been seen roaming the countryside. Furthermore, in 1988, Royal Marines were sent onto Exmoor to look for evidence of a black cat that had ravaged a farmer's sheep herd. Some even reported seeing the cat, but the investigation was never taken further. Linda Ortega. The irony in Linda Ortega's case was clear to everyone when the news of her disappearance reached major media organizations in September of 2012. Linda had gone for a walk with her brother in their local woods in the Ozarks, a mountain range just north of Arkansas with this afternoon activity in the aid of learning survival techniques. Her brother, Eddie, was an expert in this area, but his sister Linda, not so much. Was a lot of concern when Linda became separated from her brother. Walking through the forest, the pair entered a part of it that Eddie suddenly found unfamiliar, despite dozens of excursions there. With Linda beside him, he looked up through the trees hoping to find some degree of positioning from the mountains around them. When he looked beside him again, Linda was gone. A search party was sent into the forest to find her, but with winter temperatures beginning to set in and having hope was fading fast for the inexperienced 53-year-old lost alone in the forest. She was to re-emerge almost a week later, dazed and confused, but saying how glad she was that the forest had released her. This disorientation did not go unnoticed, and the chief deputy of the local region, Dwayne Pierce, said when she came out of the woods, she wasn't quite about her head. Linda had managed to use some of the tips her brother had imparted to her before they got separated, surviving on berries, but sleeping on the cold frozen ground as she wandered through the maze of towering trees. But she maintained she was not alone through this ordeal. Dark figures in their forest appeared at dusk, silhouettes that moved through the trees. But no matter how much she screamed, they couldn't hear her. 
they constantly watched. Needless to say, she was relieved to step out of that forest alive. The disappearance of Matthew Green Matthew Green was a beloved maths teacher in Nazareth and an outdoor enthusiast who was last seen in 2013 in the Mammoth Lakes area. Green was hiking with friends in the region and staying at the Shady Rest Campground. Due to car trouble, he was unable to join his friends on a trail and instead agreed to stay behind while his car was repaired and then meet up with them down the line. That day, he called the car repair shop and his parents to inform them that he was spending one more day in the mountains and texted friends in the evening. Green was never seen or heard from after this. When his friends returned to find his car had been fixed and waiting for him for over a week, they contacted the Mammoth Lake Police Department. Green had told his parents he was spending a day in the mountains in his final phone call, but he had not specified where. Green's loved ones started looking at the evidence at hand to predict where he had headed. Green had previously mentioned wanting to climb on glacier ice and had a habit of tearing out pages from his guidebook for the adventures he was pursuing. The pages missing were the rugged and icy terrain around Mount Ritter. Pouncing on this new lead, several of Green's friends and family flew to California and to shoot high-resolution videos over the land. Despite best efforts, there was no sighting of Green and a Pennsylvanian judge declared him dead four days after his disappearance. Hopes were raised when a pair of eyeglasses strikingly similar to the ones worn by Green were found by a hiker in the Inyo Craters region. But these were later confirmed not to be Green's. With little evidence and nobody ever found, Green's fate remains a mystery. His family and friends mostly believe that Green was injured on the trail and either died immediately or eventually succumbed to the elements. Mount Ritter is an extremely challenging terrain, likened to climbing a stack of crackers that even the most experienced climber would struggle on. With peaks reaching 13,000 feet, any misstep of Green's would have resulted in a fall which would almost certainly have killed him. However, Green was known to be an experienced and cautious mountaineer. Aware of the hardship of the trail, he would have been extra careful and critical in his movements and if he thought the situation was getting too difficult, he would have turned back. This doubt has led Green's sister to wonder whether her brother was actually a victim of foul play. Green might have hitched a ride from another given his car had broken down or had a run-in with the workers in the car repair shop. Have never been given closure to the case of what happened to the popular maths teacher. They continue to use the Find Matthew Green Facebook page for any further updates. When the ancient Greek civilization first journeyed to Egypt and laid witness to the ancient cultures, methods of construction, megalithic structures, sprawling cities, and seemingly advanced technologies, along with the civilization's incredible strides in mathematics and philosophy, not only were they completely intrigued by this, but they quickly worked to try to classify what they saw and provided it with the names we know today. When the ancient Greeks came across the large stone structure that depicted what they presumed to be a lion with the face of a man, reminding the Greeks of the stories of the Sphinx recorded in the struggle of Oedipus, they quickly named the structure of the Sphinx as an ode to their own culture seen in the Egyptian culture. However, outside of this original encounter, nothing else was known surrounding the strange structure. This in turn has caused various discoveries to be made about the structure and various theories to be put forward in order to explain the origins of the structure. Is there evidence of water erosion? During the early 1950s, French Egyptologist R. A. Schwalder de Lubitz visited the Great Sphinx enclosure and remarked that there was a substantial amount of water erosion across the structure. Believing that perhaps the structure had been submerged at one point in time and had not been significantly weathered by the wind as previous theories had claimed. Shortly after this claim, Schwal was labeled a mystic and slandered by countless other archaeologists who believed that Schwal was making up the claim to appeal to a fringe group of theorists at the time. Despite these personal attacks, alternative Egyptologist and author John Anthony West sought out the opinion of the Associate Professor of Natural Sciences at the College of General Studies at Boston University, a geologist by the name of Robert M. Schott. Back in 1989, Robert M. Schott then spent a significant amount of time investigating the enclosure's geology and came to the conclusion that the main type of weathering that was evident on the Sphinx's enclosure walls were caused by significant amounts of water damage and not that of natural wind and sand degradation previously theorized. Interestingly, Robert Schock also found that the weathering was consistent with blocks found at the Valley Temples, leading Schock to claim the following statement. Therefore, if the granite facing is covering deeply weathered limestone, the original limestone structures must predate by considerable degree the granite facing. 
Obviously, if the limestone cores originating from the Sphinx ditch of the temples predate the granite ashlars, granite facings, and the granite ashlars are attributable to the Khafre of the 4th dynasty. Then the Great Sphinx was built prior to the reign of Khafre. Given the fact that the Egyptian government is keen to maintain the history that the ancient Egyptian civilization was responsible for the megalithic structures and not some unknown civilization that predates their culture, it would explain why efforts had been made to cover up the findings over the decades. Today, the water erosion hypothesis is still shunned by the Egyptological community. There's also been a lot of conversation about the secret tunnels under the Great Sphinx. Back in 1987, a Japanese research team from Tokyo's Wazita University began an extensive underground survey of the regions surrounding the Great Sphinx statue. Utilizing groundbreaking technology at the time known as the Electromagnetic Sounding Survey Radar in an attempt to better image the sunken regions of the Sphinx statue. Under the direction of lead researcher Sakuhi Yoshimura, the team got some of the most accurate 3D rendered images of the statue ever seen, with the strange revelation that no one had seen coming. For some unknown reason, the Japanese survey team discovered an extensive system of cavities and tunnels inside and underneath the Great Sphinx monolith that were believed to have been previously undiscovered. According to the team, south of the Sphinx was a hollow tunnel believed to have been 2.5 meters wide and 3 meters tall connecting two chambers, a small and large chamber that appears to connect to additional tunnels that stretch north, south and southeast of the Sphinx's direction. Portions of shafts were found in unconnected areas beneath the Sphinx with additional cavities found inside the structure of the Sphinx and beside the body of the Sphinx unconnected to the tunnels beneath the monolith. None of these findings have been pursued by after the survey with many denying the existence of the tunnels and shafts, despite the mountains of clear imaging evidence gathered under the direction of lead researchers. Another question that's been put forward is, is the Sphinx really a Sphinx? Originally a theory put forward by the groundbreaking author Robert Temple, there appeared to be overwhelming evidence that the Sphinx we know today was actually an attempt to do nothing more than to claim the works of those before him. Evidence for this can be found when analyzing the head-to-body ratio of the large Sphinx statue. The head on the Sphinx is so small compared to the rest of its body that researchers had often believed, upon first sight, that it could have been grinded down from a much more massive structure. The second piece of evidence provided by the hieroglyphics located at the Temple of Temchifer that outline in great detail that the original god of ancient Giza was Anubis, and the accounts and images of Anubis in his jackal form are drawn all throughout the site in the same pose as of the body of the Sphinx, with no mention of a lion of any kind at that ancient city. Interestingly, this exact same pose was discovered in one of the only tombs of an Egyptian pharaoh ever discovered that had been completely undisturbed since his burial the tomb of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Within King Tut's tomb is a shrine to Anubis that demonstrates an exact scale of the Sphinx statue, but with the head of a jackal to represent Anubis, showing an overwhelming evidence that the original statue of the ancient city of Giza was supposed to be that of a jackal-headed Anubis and not that of a lion body with a human head. So, where do we get the idea of a human head and a lion body? The truth is, the only reason why the statue is referred to as a sphinx is because of old Greek mythologies, such as those of Oedipus, that talk about a lion with the head of a man called a sphinx, but no such symbol exists in that of ancient Egypt. This means that the hieroglyphic texts that describe the sphinx with a human head to represent the pharaoh of the fourth dynasty were nothing more than forgeries. And these were by the then pharaoh to take credit for a great statue of which he had not created nor designed. In fact, a pre-dynastic pharaoh gives a great account about providing his royal dog as a grand burial at the site of ancient Giza. In this text, his argument for why he had such a royal burial for what has been speculated to be his guard dog was due to his want and need to have the dog buried before the great god Anubis. Not only definitively proving that the sphinx was originally that of the god Anubis in the jackal form, but also that the structure itself was created during the pre-dynastic times long before any pharaoh could claim ownership of its creation. So does the sphinx predate Egypt? Given the fact that the pharaoh of the fourth dynasty forged the creation of the sphinx under his name, countless researchers believe that the sphinx could in fact be far older than anyone else has ever realized. In fact, new evidence and research today has found that it could very well be possible that the Sphinx structure itself is far older than supposed Egyptian writings and documents. One of the main reasons for why the Sphinx has been dated its current age of 4,511 years old is not due to carbon dating or other reliable efforts made to accurately measure its date. 
but rather because of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics and documents which that detail that the Sphinx were supposedly created during the reign of Egypt's fourth dynasty. Unfortunately, it was recently discovered that these documents could very well not be legitimate and that the pharaoh of the fourth dynasty forged them for the sole purpose of taking credit of another past pharaoh's work. A common practice amongst pharaohs to rewrite history and take the honor of a past pharaoh's lifelong efforts. This could very well mean that not only was the creation of the Sphinx older than that of the dynastic reigns of Egypt, but that perhaps the structure is older than the Egyptian civilization themselves. Further evidence of this theory can be found when analyzing the recent archaeological finds of strange bones discovered all throughout ancient Egypt. It is well known amongst Egyptologists that the ancient Egyptians treasured animals of all kinds, believing them to be the representation of their gods. It is due to this observation that strange structures and bones from animals all around the world, even from areas previously believed to have not been operating open trade routes, have surfaced all across ancient Egyptian cities. Described as Egyptian zoos, strange hieroglyphics and designs have come forward showing evidence that not only were the early Egyptians capable of owning strange beasts from around the world, but that they possibly possessed an extinct species of woolly mammoth. Dubbed as the world's first zoo, a 6,000-year-old ancient Egyptian cemetery was uncovered filled with the remains of wild animals from all around the world that should have been unable to collect from the reaches of early man for thousands of years to come. Skeletons of ostriches, crocodiles, leopards, and other exotic animals were found alongside pools of water large fenced-in cages and a potential animal hospital filled with removed molars, teeth, claws, and evidence of animal surgeries. Though the importance of animals regarding the Egyptian religion was widely known, the evidence of the global reach of the species available to them, including species long believed to be extinct, has been a mystery that even the most elite of archaeologists and Egyptologists have failed to explain. This is odd though mostly due to the fact that it is widely believed by historians and archaeologists all around the world that the oldest civilization to exist was merely 10,000 years old. However, evidence in the fossil record shows that the modern-day intelligent human has been around for more than 500,000 years. If this is true, why is it then that the oldest cities don't start appearing until past 10,000 years? It might have to do with the evidence of the extinct animals recorded at Egypt. The woolly mammoth was one of many distinct megafauna that went extinct at around the same time in the fossil record, nearly 10,000 years ago. These extinct species included the mastodon, short-faced bear, the giant ground sloth, and many others. In fact, when Charles Darwin first visited the areas near the Galapagos Islands, when he originally discovered the ground sloth bones, they were so fresh that he believed them to still be a living species of megafauna, ultimately proving the recency of their extinction. So why was it then that around 10,000 years ago of all these species went extinct, partly due to three strange reasons, large fires, a massive flood, and a sudden ice age? The evidence for these three events are widely known by archaeologists and research scientists that found in the fossil record evidence that showed that all around the Earth. There appeared to be massive fires that were followed by a rapid cooling event that only took about four decades as well as certain events being hit by numerous tsunamis and large flooding. Many experts had originally speculated that perhaps a massive meteorite strike could have caused such a phenomenon, but no large craters supporting the theory had yet been discovered at the time of the original publications. However, recently a massive crater underneath an ice sheet in Greenland shows a tremendous impact point where a meteor could have hit, generating more than 700 megatons of force. So much force, in fact, that it would have caused a full-on nuclear winter. Any human civilization at the time, regardless of how advanced, would have been completely wiped off the face of the Earth in such a massive meteor strike. All of this happening at not only around the same time as a massive extinction event, but also around the same time the oldest civilizations would have been constructed. Could this be evidence then that perhaps the pyramids at Giza and the Sphinx, as well as many other advancements made in megalithic structures and creations, could actually more accurately have come from the efforts of human beings from before this catastrophic event and the Egyptians where humanity left off. Given the incredible advancements we have made in the past 10,000 years, this could very well mean that the humans before the event could have been significantly more advanced than we are today. And the old stories of gods and kings could very well have just been the technological advancements before humanity had to reset due to such a catastrophic tragedy. Linda Ortega
The irony in Linda Ortega's case was clear to everyone when the news of her disappearance reached major media organizations in September of 2012. Linda had gone for a walk with her brother in their local woods in the Ozarks, a mountain range just north of Arkansas with this afternoon activity in the aid of learning survival techniques. Her brother, Eddie, was an expert in this area, but his sister Linda, not so much. Was a lot of concern when Linda became separated from her brother. Walking through the forest, the pair entered a part of it that Eddie suddenly found unfamiliar, despite dozens of excursions there. With Linda beside him, he looked up through the trees hoping to find some degree of positioning from the mountains around them. When he looked beside him again, Linda was gone. A search party was sent into the forest to find her, but with winter temperatures beginning to set in and having hope was fading fast for the inexperienced 53-year-old lost alone in the forest. She was to re-emerge almost a week later, dazed and confused, but saying how glad she was that the forest had released her. This disorientation did not go unnoticed and the chief deputy of the local region, Dwayne Pierce, said when she came out of the woods she wasn't quite about her head. Linda had managed to use some of the tips her brother had imparted to her before they got separated, but sleeping on the cold frozen ground as she wandered through the maze of towering trees. But she maintained she was not alone through this ordeal. Dark figures in their forest appeared at dusk, silhouettes that moved through the trees. But no matter how much she screamed, they couldn't hear her. They constantly watched. Needless to say, she was relieved to step out of that forest alive. Hannah up. We talk about missing persons all the time here on the channel, but what about a woman who has disappeared on three different occasions? The first time 28-year-old schoolteacher Hannah Up disappeared, she was gone for 20 days. She was found floating face down in the waters a mile out from Manhattan. She claims she had gone for a jog on August 28, 2008. The scary part is she was pulled from the water on September 16th. Hannah disappeared right before the beginning of a new school year. She taught Spanish at Thurgood Marshall Academy. She left her wallet, her phone, and her keys and disappeared into one of the biggest cities on the planet. The jog is the last thing Hannah remembered. In an interview, she stated it was like 10 minutes had passed, but it was almost three weeks. But Hannah did not move around the city in the days following the jog. She was caught on security cameras at an Apple store where she checked her email. Later, she reappeared at the Apple store, then at Starbucks, and finally at several different New York sports clubs where it is thought she showered. At the hospital, Hannah was diagnosed with a disorder called disassociation fugue. In this state, a person can completely forget all or part of their identity. The person also seems to take part in some kind of unexpected travel. Being found in the churning ocean waters was just the first time Hannah had an episode. Five years later, in September 2013, Hannah had a new job as an assistant teacher in Maryland. Her parents were informed that her belongings were found near a path and she was missing. Two days later, Hannah regained her memory. She was in a creek with a shopping cart. She borrowed a cell phone, called her mother, and was picked up. Only a year after this episode, Hannah was on the move again. She again took a job as a teacher and moved to St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was 2017 and Hurricane Irma tore through the area. Though her home was severely damaged, Hannah was fine. On September 14, 2017, Hannah told her roommates she was going to work, but she didn't make it. Nor did she make it home that evening. The next day, Hannah's keys and a pile of folded clothes were found on a beach. For three days, the beaches were searched for her. The search had to be cut short because Hurricane Maria was on its way. With Hannah's affinity for wandering always near water, it's a safe bet she found her way into the ocean. Between two violent hurricanes, though, her body has never shown up. Her family never gives up, however. A Facebook page was launched and a GoFundMe was started to prolong search efforts. And on a 2019 documentary called Vanishing in Paradise, her parents hold on to hope. When promoting the documentary, her parents stated, we never know what unexpected connection may lead us to a clue to locating her again. All it would take is for one person to see the program and recognize her. The Disappearance of Zahir Rehan Zahir Rehan was one of the most famous writers, novelists, and filmmakers in Bangladesh before 1972. His most famous film piece was Stop Genocide, a 20-minute documentary that highlighted the murders and atrocities that the Pakistan army was carrying out against the people of East Pakistan. This film, along with many others he made, showed his transformation from an artist to a freedom fighter. In 1971, he became an active fighter in the Liberation War of Bangladesh. 
His main weapon during this war were his documentary films where he intended to show the world what his people were fighting for. Rehan's brother, Shahid al was a writer and key freedom fighter in the Bangladesh Liberation War. Together, the brothers collected medicine, food, and other essential supplies and delivered them to different stronghold posts around the fighting areas. It was noted that other freedom fighters held the brothers in high regard for their heroic contributions during the war. After the war ended in 1971, the Pakistan army formed an alliance with locals in Bangladesh to carry out the plan of killing the area's leading intellectuals. On this list of creatives was Zahir Rahan's brother, who on December 14, 1971, was captured by the Pakistan army. After hearing of his brother's capture, Zahir Rahan embarked on the mission to find and liberate his brother. Even though he was known for being a fierce fighter, many of his revolutionary friends urged him not to go, believing that the Pakistan army would be looking for him too. Blinded by the love for his brother, Rahan ignored all warnings and proceeded to lead a search party across Bangladesh. It is believed that Rahan followed the trail of his captured brother to the capital city of Dhaka. Entering the suburb of Mirpur, Rehan and his search party were ambushed by soldiers of the Pakistan army who were hiding in surrounding buildings. Although there were many casualties in this ambush, Rehan's body was not amongst the dead. Therefore, it is possible that Rehan might have been a lucky escape and continued on with his search for his brother. The only thing known for sure is that neither brother was ever seen again. The disappearance of Bart Schleyer Bart Schleyer was an avid outdoorsman and had completed a master's degree in wildlife biology. After he finished his degree, Bart worked for Fish and Game and the interagency grizzly bear study team in Montana. His job, along with the rest of his team, was to study grizzly bears' reaction to coming across humans in the wild. During his research, he would camp out in the wilderness for sometimes months at a time. He would pack meat as grizzly bait and cable used for foot snares. Bart Schleyer practically lived outdoors, always wanting to study and be in the wilderness. He would use bow and arrows and was very experienced as a whole. The 14th of September 2004 was Bart Schleyer's last known contact with a float plane that had dropped him off in Canada's Yukon Territory. For this trip, Bart left carrying enough food for two weeks, an inflatable raft and camping equipment. Two weeks later, the same plane returned to pick Bart up, but he wasn't there. After being officially reported missing on the 30th of September, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police initiated a full-scale search and rescue but didn't find Schleyer. Only some food at his camp and his inflatable raft was found half a mile away from his campsite. With the weather turning severe in the area, the police believe Bart hiked up to the nearby highway. After this disappointing conclusion, a friend of Bart Schleyer, Dib Williams, and pilot Wayne Curry decided to fly out to the camp after the search was over to investigate further. They then found Bart's tent along with his backpack, radio, bear repellent, and a knife. Not believing that Schleyer would leave all this equipment behind and getting more worried for Schleyer's well-being, Williams, accompanied by Warner Curry, set out the next day to continue their search. After finding Schleyer's bow and arrows and a camouflage face mask with blood on, decided to call the Royal Canadian Mountain Police back to search the area and investigate further. The police, as well as Yukon conservation officers and other volunteers ventured back to the area on the 3rd of October. Around 60 meters or so from the location the bow and arrow was found, some clothing, a camera and part of a skull were found. The skull was identified as that of Bart Schleyer, though no more of his body was found. Grizzly bear droppings found in the immediate vicinity that Schleyer was the victim of a grizzly bear attack. However, conflicting opinions and lack of clothing found with bone fragments in the droppings, the fact that bears usually bury kills and no sign of a struggle led to skepticism of a bear attack being the cause. In addition, those who knew him believed he was too experienced in the wilderness to be caught off guard and the fact that if it was a bear attack, his nearby camp would likely have been raided by the bear for food too. Furthermore, the bears normally go for the head when attacking people and no tooth marks were found on his skull. Stephen Grunwald Discovered in the Rocky Mountain National Park 24-year-old Stephen Grunwald of Greenville, New York, was seen alive for the last time in Boulder, Colorado on August 28, 2020. On September 10, he was reported missing, but tragically, he had already passed away by August 29. Grunwald's friends became concerned after he did not return from a hiking trip they believed he planned to take in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Grunwald had been roaming the area for a while as he was considering moving there. 
Towards the beginning of the search, park rangers located his vehicle parked at the Glacier Gorge trailhead. It was assumed that he had attempted the Glacier Gorge Traverse. The trail is difficult, stretching 19 miles and home to 11 peak summits. But Grunwald was known as someone well-suited to the outdoors. Unfortunately, after the discovery of the car, the search went downhill. They could not proceed because a storm that had arrived in the area on September 8th left 10 inches of snow in the park, along with 50 miles per hour winds and an 11 degree wind chill. Searchers had to wait for the storm to end to actually search the trail. Only a few days later, they were covering serious terrain on the Glacier Gorge. They looked around rocks and fields but couldn't search the steep alpine areas because of ice buildup. Grunwald's body was found on September 14th. On this day, the weather had warmed up to the 60s and conditions became more favorable to search the entire area. The searchers camped in Lake Powell the night before and resumed activity early on Monday. Aerial searches were conducted on both days as well. A dog team from the Front Range Rescue greatly contributed to the finding of Grunwald's body, which was quickly transported by helicopter to a landing zone, and then to the Larimer County Coroner's for an autopsy. Apparently, loss of life is not uncommon in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Seven other passings were reported in the same year. The coroner officially deemed Grunwald's loss of life an accident caused by multiple blunt force injuries. While foul play is not suspected, the specific conditions of his passing remain a mystery. Body of man missing since 1997 found thanks to Google Maps. In 2019, a 20-year-old cold case was solved after Google Earth gave the clue to find a missing man. William Moult, aged 40, went missing from Lantana, Florida in 1997 after a night out. On November 7, 1997, he never made it home from the club. We know that Moult left the club at approximately 11 p.m. and had called his girlfriend just hours before at 9.30 p.m. to say that he would be home shortly. Although he was not known to be a frequent drinker, reports state that he had a few drinks before leaving in his car that November night. A missing person investigation was conducted and the police worked to find Malt and bring him home, but with no new leads and little information to work with, the search was unsuccessful. William Malt became a cold case. Then, 22 years later, on August 28, 2019, there was a breakthrough in the case, though not one that would promise Malt's safe return. A man who had previously lived in the area had been doing a Google search according to local police when he stumbled across what looked like a sunken car in a local lake. Whilst using the search engine's Earthview feature, the once local resident got in touch with someone who he knew was living in the area. Mubay Circle, Wellington, at the time and shared what he saw. Upon hearing this incredibly alarming news, the current local used his own drone to confirm that it was in fact a sunken car that had been seen in the pond. Once they had verified that there was indeed a vehicle submerged in the spot, they contacted local authorities. The car was dragged from the water and human remains were found inside. However, 20 years on, the body was not immediately recognizable. The skeletal remains were identified as being those of William Malt one week later. The Charlie Project, an American database of cult cases, has stated that the Google Earth satellite photo had left the car in plain sight since 2007, though it flew under the radar and lay unnoticed until 2019. Following the discovery of William Malt, some speculation began to grow as to the timeline of events on the night of his disappearance. Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office said in a statement to the BBC that the assumption is that after a night of drinking, Malt lost control of the car on his way home, driving himself into the pond. The law enforcement elaborated, saying that when the initial investigation was in the works two decades prior, there was no evidence of that occurring and that it was only a shift in the water that later made the car visible. Police spokeswoman Therese Barbara said, you can't determine what happened that many years ago, what transpired. All we know is that he went missing off the face of the earth and now he has been discovered. Whilst it certainly may give his family some peace of mind to finally have an answer, even if it is not a positive one, it seems there is nothing more to tell in the solving of this mystery. We may never definitively know what happened on the night of November 7, 1997. Uranium at the Grand Canyon Considered one of the seven natural wonders of the world, the Grand Canyon is a natural attraction visited by millions every year. The geological marvel is known for its layered bands of red rock that expose a tremendous geological history. However, the landmark also holds deposits of minerals that have enticed miners for years. Uranium naturally occurs within the rocks and the Grand Canyon. 
Uranium is a radioactive material, meaning radiation is always present in the surrounding environment. A study confirmed that the amount of radiation in the air is at background level and is not of concern for the public's health or canyon spectators. Uranium mining at the Grand Canyon began with the uranium craze in the 1950s. Millions of tons of ore were mined from the area during this time. There are hundreds of now-abandoned uranium mines surrounding the Grand Canyon that have been polluting the geological wonder as well as the homes of the Havasupai tribe. When the uranium market picked up again in the mid-2000s, mining around the area continued, this time leaving behind thousands of uranium ore claims. The water supply and surrounding environment greatly suffered from this, leaving the Havasupai people with a contaminated water supply. In 2012, a 20-year ban on uranium mining was finally placed on 1 million acres of the Grand Canyon and surrounding area to protect all that depend on the land. The mining ban also gave scientists adequate time to research the long-term effects of those radioactive mines and the severity of the risk to local people and animals. However, as of October 2020, there were still over 600 active mining claims in public lands around the Grand Canyon. On February 15, 2021, Representative Raul Grijalva, an American politician, introduced the Grand Canyon Protection Act, H.R. 1052, to once and for all ban new uranium mines around Grand Canyon National Park. It passed the House with bipartisan support less than two weeks later and is currently in the Senate. While this is excellent news, the it is not the only uranium-related scandal in the Grand Canyon. From the years 2000 to 2018, three five-gallon buckets of uranium ore were displayed at the Grand Canyon National Park Museum beside a taxidermy exhibit. After nearly two decades in the museum, patron Elston Stevenson reported the buckets to a Park Service radiation specialist for safety concerns. After the report, the area around the buckets was tested for radiation and was said to have a higher than the background or safe amount of radiation. However, the reports found that the rest of the museum was unaffected by the radioactive buckets. Even though this was considered to be of minimal risk to employees and visitors, the buckets were removed and safely discarded from the display. Strange circles appeared on the frozen surface of Lake Baikal being seen by astronauts. In many ways, Lake Baikal is extraordinary. It is the world's largest in terms of volume and deepest freshwater lake, being 1,637 meters at its deepest point. It is also one of the world's oldest lakes, being 25 to 30 million years old, with up to 7 kilometers of sediment deposited on the bottom. Because it is located in the Baikal Rift Valley, the lake has a long, thin, and deep shape. Strange ice rings have been growing in Lake Baikal since 1969, but the actual mechanism behind their formation has remained a mystery for decades. Researchers have finally figured out what is causing these strange sightings, according to a new study published in the journal Limnology and Oceography. Astronauts on board the International Space Station saw a strange circular patch of thinned ice near the southern end of Lake Baikal in southern Siberia in late April 2009. Siberia is an isolated and freezing place with ice, with ice cover that can last far into June. Its top view, a close-up astronaut snapshot, depicts a circle of thin ice, dark in hue, with a diameter of roughly 4.4 kilometers. That serves as the focal point for ice breakup in the lake's southernmost reaches. The feature was initially observed on April 5, 2009, according to a series of Modi's pictures. Another very identical circle is then found at the lake's center, a top and underwater ridge that cuts the lake in half. Both rings were seen till April 20, 2009, until April 24 when the circular piece of thin ice became a hole of open water. Clouds covered the middle of the lake. In April 1994, during the STS-59 shuttle mission and 1985, similar circular ice patterns were observed in the same central section of the lake, though not quite as prominent during the STS. 51B Shuttle Mission Although the ring's origin is uncertain, the strange pattern indicates convection, tidal in the lake's water column. At this time of year, ice cover fluctuates frequently. The ice can melt nearly completely in a day and freeze during the night. The rings arise as ice covers the ground and subsequently fade as the ice melts throughout April. Because of the pattern and look, the ice appears to be relatively thin. The main cause of this warm, deep water formation is unknown, but the study is ongoing to learn more about it. Existing evidence suggests that water from other rivers and wind patterns may have A and that they originate in the autumn months before the ice freezes. For the time being, many secrets remain hidden within this ancient and vast lake.
The High Aim 6 The High Aim 6 was a fishing ship that set course from the South Taiwanese port of Liocio in October of 2002. When it was seen again on Australian waters in 2003, it was found abandoned without a single crew member or body in sight. Sai Huangshui, the ship's official owner, had the last communication with the ship's captain in late December of 2002. The Taiwanese ship flew under an Indonesian flag. One of the only traceable surviving crew members from Indonesia admitted that Chen Tai Cheng, the high AAM SIXS captain, had his life taken from him alongside the ship's primary engineer Ling Chengli. But the details remain murky and unsolved, with no real motive or culprit established. The high AM-6 was discovered floating on stable, gentle waters about 92 miles from the Rolly Shoals of Australia, devoid of any signs of its previous crew members. And initially there was no clear explanation for the crew's abandonment of the ship nor for their disappearances. In fact, not a single sign of distress of any kind was detected in the initial search of the ship. Everything remained in pristine condition, including the sailors' personal belongings being neatly tucked away without any sign of a panic or and the High Aim 6 had adequate longline fishing equipment on board. Further investigations revealed that the High Aim SIXS engine was not working and that the rudder was broken. The Taiwanese police believed that mutiny led to the ship's abandonment. The Indonesian police managed to track down one of 10 Indonesian men hired as crew members on the High Aim 6 who revealed the captain's life was taken from him along with the engineer on and so proceeded to escape home to Indonesia, but refused to reveal motives or further statements around the alleged happenings. Similar events have occurred in the past with Indonesian crew members, captains and engineers being taken of Taiwanese ships, such as the Harishing 6 the previous year. Scientists suggest that octopus could be aliens. When talk turns to potential extraterrestrial life on Earth, most minds immediately jump to conspiracy theorists and science fiction plots. Few expect to read findings from the scientific community hinting at alien life. Yet that is exactly what has recently come to light and not in the way that you would think. A scientific paper published in 2018 in the journal Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology attempts to explain the origins of life on Earth and makes some startling hypotheses about the octopus, suggesting that the unusual creature possesses a genome that may have gotten its start from somewhere outside of Earth. When studying the development of species, the octopus presents a unique set of problems which is what has prompted scientists to look beyond Earth for answers. For most species, distinctive and especially unusual features evolved slowly over millions of years and this progression can be more or less tracked through the species. However, the striking features of cephalopods such as their large brains and sophisticated color and shape-changing abilities arrived relatively suddenly in the evolutionary gene pool. A huge leap such as this is especially unlikely in the more advanced characteristics of a highly developed species. These traits burst onto the scene hundreds of millions of years ago in what is known as the Cambrian Explosion, where several modern-day animal groups suddenly began to exist in a form recognizable today. Nobody knows what exactly led to this event, although there are several theories. One possible explanation specifically mentioned in the paper with regards to cephalopods revolves around the cryopreserving ability of space and suggests that a piece of space rock or comet hurtling towards Earth could have contained viable specimens of an early form of fertilized squid or octopus eggs and released its contents as it crashed into our atmosphere effectively merging extraterrestrial genes with the genomes on Earth. Another hypothesis is that alien viruses crashed to Earth in a similar manner and infected the genomes of a primitive version of the squid and caused the strange evolution into what we know as octopus today. This is not the first time such a theory has been suggested with regards to the evolution of life on Earth as it is occasionally brought up as a potential explanation for the currently genetically unexplainable. However, such a theory rests entirely upon the assumption that life does exist elsewhere in the cosmos and that these life forms could have been transported across the vastness of space on a comet until they reached Earth. Understandably, hypotheses of this nature are impossible to prove and will likely remain just a hypothesis for the years to come. But the idea that we could be sharing our planet with creatures evolved from extraterrestrials is fascinating. Mysterious Disappearance of John Devine in the Olympic National Park John Devine was a 73-year-old hiker who went missing on September 7, 1997 from the Olympic National Park in Washington. He was an experienced hiker and climber who headed into the park the day before going camping. 
He planned to ascend Mount Baldy in the Olympic National Forest, nearly a 6,796-foot-high mountain. By the Maynard Burn Trail, this trail is very rugged and challenging to traverse, so an accident likely occurred and Devine was somehow injured. It was only supposed to be a day hike, so when he did not show up the following day, his entire family grew worried and called the authorities. He was subsequently declared missing and has never been found. Devine lived in Sequim, Washington, and although he was legally blind in one eye, he was in physical shape. He was an avid hiker and had gone on many solo adventures in the Olympics before his trip. His friend last saw him on September 7th, the Saturday of his hike. He had been hiking in the afternoon along the Grey World Ridge, which is on the northern side of the National Park. He had been camping with a friend just outside the park's limits in the Buckhorn Wilderness area. Devine had no gear or food with him other than a few granola bars. Although authorities conducted a search and rescue immediately, it was cut short due to a fatal helicopter crash. Shortly after taking off the mountain, a Bell 205A1 rescue helicopter crashed at the 5,000-foot level of Mount Baldy, about 20 miles south of Port Angeles. The crash ended up taking the lives of three people, Kevin Johnston, 35, the pilot and a seasoned flight instructor. Rita McMahon, 52, a volunteer who trained search dogs, and Tarion Hoover, 31, a seasonal park employee. Another five people were also injured in the crash. The helicopter crash was caused by the deteriorating weather conditions as it started to get cold and snowy once the search began. The mountainside was too rugged and dense for volunteers to search through properly. So investigators quickly brought the teams back in before it got too dark and dangerous. For them to be out on the mountain, the sergeants from the sheriff's office, who was in charge of coordinating the search team, explained to reporters and volunteers that if Devine had indeed been hiking in that area, then they would have already discovered him by now. If he had been unfortunately injured during a fall, it was improbable that he would have survived until that point in time. The search for John Devine was called off on September of his family. The leading theory is that he was ill-prepared for his hike and suffered a severe injury that caused him to lose his life. No matter the level of experience, hikers should always take nature seriously and prepare themselves for any situation. When coupled with the cold weather, it would have been difficult for Divine to survive an accident. Unfortunately, we will never know as he was never found in the forest and his disappearance remains a mystery to this very day. CIA Chiefs team member reports Havana Syndrome in early September of this year. A member of CIA Director Bill Burns' staff made national and global news when they reportedly became afflicted with the mysterious symptoms known as Havana Syndrome after a Gove trip to India. The fact that the case involved such a high-level government official renewed interest in the often strange and mind-boggling illness that appears to affect only government officials visiting other countries. Havana Syndrome is a strange illness that has been observed in diplomats and political figures starting in 2016 with U.S. Embassy diplomats in Havana, Cuba. The symptoms are often unexplained and associated with dizziness, headache, fatigue, nausea, anxiety, cognitive difficulties, and memory loss. These symptoms can vary widely in severity and several diplomats and intelligence officers who have been diagnosed with the had to leave active service due to the nature of their condition and lingering complications. Although originating in Cuba, the symptoms have been reported in China, Russia, Germany, Serbia, India, Poland, Georgia, and Taiwan. Because Havana syndrome has only been reported in diplomats, intelligence officers, and other government personnel, many people theorize that they may be targeted attacks against the government. And the CIA has placed top personnel in charge of investigating the circumstances. Burns has stated that, as of July 22, 2021, there were several hundred total reported instances of Havana syndrome globally. Thus far, the official cause of Havana syndrome has not been able to be determined, although it is not for lack of trying. It appears that the disease is causing brain damage of some sort in the individuals. And although initial reports suggested that it might have been caused by a sonic or acoustic weapon, now the predominant theory is that a strongly directed energy such as microwaves might be to blame. This conclusion was reached by a task force directed by the State Department and the National Academics of Science, Engineering and Medicine and similar studies by other entities have supported these findings. Might have been intentionally targeted to cause harm, while others believe that the damage could have been an inadvertent result of high-powered microwaves aimed at high-ranking U.S. officials in an attempt to collect data from their computers and mobile phones. 
However, nobody has been able to link the symptoms of Havana syndrome with any country or definitive cause, and the countries in which government officials have fallen ill have denied any involvement. And while it has yet to be determined what exactly the illness stems from, the CIA director's staff member is not the first to experience these strange symptoms. Although he is a chilling reminder to government officials that not even those associated with the highest inner circles of the government are truly safe. Two members of former President Donald Trump's staff were suddenly struck with the illness near entrance points to the White House, putting officials on edge about the safety of any government buildings, both on home soil and abroad. For now, officials remain on alert as they try to get to the root of what might be causing such a strange illness that only seems to affect diplomats and intelligence officials of the United States and Canada. Artificial intelligence could not crack the code. In 2018, artificial intelligence endeavored to figure out the 600-year-old code, though even the AI could not reliably figure out what this code said. The Voynich manuscript appears to contain between 25 and 30 characters, as interpretations have been varied and is written from left to right by a single hand. It is made up of 102 parchment folios, meaning it reaches approximately an astounding 234 pages in length. This objective information is minimal and does not necessarily aid in solving the mystery after the original language the manuscript was written in. The manuscript is written in an unidentified language using an alphabet that has not been seen elsewhere prior to the manuscript's discovery or after it was found. Many believe it has been written using a substitution cipher. This involves the letters of an existing language being exchanged for made-up letters to create a code. Typically, a substitution cipher is considered the simplest code and is one of the oldest methods of encrypting a text. If it really is such a simple code, then why haven't scientists been able to translate the manuscript? Scientists have no idea what the original language is to begin figuring out where the substitutions have been made. Bradley Hauer and Gregor Kondrak aim to use computational analysis in order to find a country the text may have originated from or a language it was written in. Numerous algorithms were trained to pick up the statistical fingerprints of the text and compare it to existing established languages to attempt to find a match. Factors such as the frequency of each letter and combinations of letters were used. Hauer and Kondrak began using this software on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They input 380 languages. This trial appeared to work and be successful, so they moved forward with their research. A computational linguist at Illinois Institute of Technology stated that the results were in debate, but not more so than many other results often published in the scientific literature. The next step in their artificial intelligence testing and research was for Kondrak and Hauer to apply these algorithms to the infamous Voynich manuscript. But this was where the pair began to encounter numerous issues. The initial obstacle is that the algorithm was trained to trace modern languages. The evolution of languages regarding vocabulary, grammar, syntax, and spelling is massive and so languages we use today are incredibly different to the same languages in the late medieval or early modern societies is when the manuscript was traced back to in the 15th century. Another problematic element of the AI research is that while suggestions are made for the closest matches, the probability of this being a match is not considered. Kondrak and Hauer claim to have discovered the source language, Hebrew, through their algorithm. However, this was the closest match of the 380 languages they inputted but was not a certain match. Other matches that were considered close, for example, Malay, are drastically different from Hebrew and so the validity of this algorithm may be deemed very low. The lack of evaluation regarding how likely each language is means that Hebrew may have been the closest match available but not necessarily similar enough to the source language for a substitution code. The final hurdle, and perhaps the factor that is a deal-breaker in the validity of their research, is that Kondrak and Hauer suggested Voynich Manuscript is written using not only a substitution cipher, but that it was also written in anagrams, having the letters within each word jumbled up too. Whilst this has been suggested before, it is certainly not a proven fact, just a theory. Kondrak and Hauer used Google Translate, which has a reputation for forcing nonsensical words and phrases into coherent fluent sentences. Despite all the indicators that their work should be and would be disregarded, Kondrak and Howe claimed the first sentence of the Voynich manuscript to be as follows. She made recommendations to the priest, man of the house, and me and people. The sensationalist media headlines stated that the Voynich manuscript had been deciphered and translated. 
And while we may have been drawn closer, the flawed methodology of Kondrak and Howe's work means the translation holds little weight. Maybe future artificial intelligence can solve this mystery. But for now, we still don't. Mysterious plants, codes, and astronomical signs that feature in the book. Perhaps even more puzzling than the mysterious Voynich language appears to be written in are the bizarre illustrations, doodles, and diagrams that accompany the unknown writing. Images included in the manuscript depict strange plants, astrological diagrams, castles, dragons, and perhaps the most puzzling image an unclothed woman in what appears to be a bath. While some outlandish theories suggest ancient water park designs, others suggest medicinal information or even alien technology. One theory posed by Dr. Cheshire, a linguist at Bristol University, suggested it was a manual covering relationships and parenting written in a code based off of a proto-romantic language. Dr. Cheshire believes it aligns with the Catholic and Roman pagan beliefs held by many Mediterranean Europeans in the 15th century. Dr. Cheshire states that he believed the Voynich manuscript was written by Dominican nuns. Bristol University commented following media coverage, concerns have been raised about the validity of this research and went on to ensure it is known that Dr. Cheshire's work is not affiliated with the university. However, perhaps the most common guess is that the Voynich manuscript details medical information. Herbal remedies were common, explaining the plant diagrams, and many believed there was a correlation between the position of the stars and individuals' health, hence zodiac images being included. Furthermore, a bath was thought to cure many illnesses, explaining the image of the unclothed woman bathing. This suggests that health and medicine is a common factor between a fair few of the illustrations in the Voynich manuscript. The medicinal theory has been suggested by many, one of whom is historian Nicholas Gibbs in 2017. He offered the suggestion that the images centered health for the reasons just mentioned, but also that the manuscript was a pseudoscientific women's health manual. He, like many others, claimed to have solved the code and believed the absurdly complex codes were Latin abbreviations and that the Voynich manuscript was written in common shorthand that would have been understood in the 15th century and was not code that needed to be broken. His work was heavily criticized and ultimately discredited because Nicholas Gibbs either reiterated ideas people before him had suggested and his own theories, the translated sentences made little to no grammatical sense in Latin. The dismissal of Nicholas Gibbs's research ultimately means the contents of the Voynich manuscript remain a mystery, but the bizarre images seem to have an underlying theme. The Voynich manuscript appears to be split into seven distinct sections. Botanical containing imagery of herbs and plants, Astronomical with pictures such as the sun, moon, and stars. Cosmological illustrated with circular geometric designs. The zodiac section containing drawings of the zodiac signs. Biological which has depictions of unclothed women in various baths. Pharmaceutical with images of containers and herbs side by side. And finally, the recipe section which contains no illustrations, merely lines of text with stars in the margin. These theories are simply based upon where certain images lie within the text. As of today, the manuscript remains a mystery. The more time that passes, the more speculation and rumors continue to grow, and every few years we can be sure someone new will step forward announcing that they have found a new translation. But with so many experts eager to add to the research, such claims are often quickly refuted. Great minds are puzzled by the nature of the Voynich manuscript. The Cold War saw the involvement of the FBI, fearing it was a coded form of communist propaganda and still no solution or understanding was found. Will we ever figure out this impossible code? Arguably the world's most mysterious book allegedly figured out over and over and still nobody can read it. Linguists, historians, and cryptographers have puzzled over it for centuries and will continue to do so until we solve this mystery. What lies within the Voynich Manuscript? Mitchell Dale Stelling on June 20, 2013, 51-year-old Dale Stelling, his wife, Deneen, and his parents were vacationing in Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. Stelling loved the outdoors, spending much of his time camping and gardening. On this day, Stelling planned to make the quarter-mile hike to the Spruce Tree House ruin. Spruce Tree House is the third largest cliff dwelling in the country, and was constructed by the ancestors of the Pueblo peoples of the Southwest. The dwelling contains about 130 rooms and eight ceremonial chambers. This amazing site was built right into the cliff wall and is a huge draw to tourists. Due to health reasons, both his wife and his parents were unable to make the hike, but that didn't stop Stelling from going at it alone. He left for this hike at around 430. 
The temperature was in the 90s and Stelling did not take water on his hike, a terrible oversight for any hike. The hike should have taken an hour, but after two had passed, his family reported him missing. At first, the family was told to give him more time. The park had never had a missing person who did not turn up within a few hours. After the wait, a thorough two-week search was launched. Two dogs and a helicopter were all involved in the search. In the first days of the search, the dogs initially showed interest in the Chapin Mesa area, but no sign of him was found there. Oddly, evidence shows Stelling had cell service at least the night of his disappearance. Records show an attempt to check his voicemail at 7 p.m. Why would he check his voicemail but not call for help if he was lost remains a mystery. Despite being seen on the trail, no sign of Stelling has ever turned up. Rangers in the area believe Stelling met his end among the many cliffs and crevices in the park. They state that much of the park is uncharted and therefore off-limits. Stelling's case remains open, although Stelling's wife, Deneen, claims it has never been thorough enough for her liking. Deneen has visited the park three more times over the years, hoping for new answers that have never come.